Good morning, everyone. I'm Isabel Montañez, Chair of the Board of Earth Sciences and Resources and a Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of California, Davis, where I'm also the Director of the UC Davis Institute of the Environment. Kathy Kling, uh, who you can't see, but to my right, is Director of the Water Sciences and Technology Board and the Tisch University Professor of Environmental Energy and Resource Economics at Cornell University and the Faculty Director of the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future. And she is the co-convener of the meeting. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's meeting on the future of managed aquifer recharge in the US. So I'm gonna start with just a brief overview of the mission of the National Academy of Sciences and the two boards who are sponsoring this, this meeting. So the investigative arm of the National Academy of Sciences aims to be the nation's preeminent source of expert evidence-based and objective advice on science, uh, engineering and health matters. And the NAS and its boards provide a neutral convening body that supports the use of scientific research for evidence-based policymaking and to recruit scientific and technology specialists to participate in advisory work and confronting uh, challenging issues for the benefit of society. Next slide. The Water and Science Technology Board is chaired by Kathy Kling, as I mentioned, of Cornell University and consists of a board of volunteers that span a broad diversity of expertise and backgrounds. And I invite you to look through the agenda booklet for the members' bios. This board is the National Academy's focal point for activities and issues related to water science and resources, including surface and groundwater, aquifers and ecosystem restoration and management, water infrastructure systems, water reuse, wastewater, water hazards and mitigation, and hazardous waste cleanup and water quality. Next slide, please. <coughs> The Board of Earth Sciences and Resources, which I chair, is the National Academy's focal point for activities and issues relevant to solid earth sciences and resources. And again, I invite you to look through the agenda booklet for the members' bios. We cover a broad topical space, including a range of geologic hazards, energy and mineral resources and stewardship, geographic, geologic, and geospatial mapping and modeling, geological and geotechnical engineering, carbon sequestration and the energy transition, strategic directions for earth science research, the intersection of geology and health, and environmental justice and equity in earth science, and education and workforce development. Dr. Deborah Glickson oversees as director of both of these boards. Next slide, please. Okay. The funding sources for both boards are diverse and showcase the breadth of earth sciences. Core funding is currently supported by the Department of Energy, Chemical Sciences, Geosciences, and Biosciences Division, and the Basic Energy Sciences. NASA's Earth's Surface and Interior Focus Area, NSF's Division of Earth Sciences in the Geosciences Directorate, and the Chemical Bioengineering, Environmental, and Transport Systems in Engineering Directorate. United States Geological Survey, Core Science Systems, as one of our sponsors, uh, Energy and Mineral Resources, and Natural Hazards. Next slide, please. So today we'll be discussing the current and emerging issues in managed aquifer recharge in the US, a topic of great relevance to the water science, resources and earth science communities. We'll be assessing how the national academies can help the utilities, municipal, municipalities and agricultural sectors and others uh, in the efforts to adapt to climate change and its impacts. And we aim to better understand the role that managed and aquifer recharge can play in meeting water demands in the US over the next 30 to 50 years. And next slide, please. You'll find the agenda for the two day meeting in the booklet. Uh, today, we'll start with two speakers uh, who will address the status of US aquifers under climate change and an introduction to managed aquifer recharge, followed by a series of case study presentations. And the second part of the meeting, uh, if I can go ahead and give me the next slide, please, uh, will be held tomorrow. We'll include two panel discussions on the technical and institutional considerations for the managed aquifer recharge. And for today, we may have time for a question or two following each of the first two speakers, but otherwise, 
Questions from the audience, the board and B's responsors will be addressed in the Q&A function of uh, following the case study presentations. So please enter your questions into the Q&A function of the Zoom meeting. Note that the webinar is being recorded. So any questions you submit may be read aloud and it will be included in our recording. And a link to the recording will be posted on our website. All right, so now I would like to introduce our first speaker. Bridget Scanlon, who is a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology in the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Bridget is a member of the NAE and has conducted research on groundwater recharge across regional to global scales. I'm gonna turn the screen to you, Bridget. Um, thank you so much, Isabel. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about recharge um, uh, at the beginning of this session. And I was asked to discuss the status of US aquifers under a changing climate. So I'm uh, going to talk about what we did under the Powell Research Group uh, with the USGS that involved um, NASA and USGS and academic uh, researchers, and some of them listed here. Um, next slide. So uh, I talk a little bit about the current status and provide some background on the US aquifers and depletion that has occurred to date, and then uh, consider the, both the direct impacts of climate change and indirect impacts through changes in uh, groundwater pumpage and other uh, processes, and then how we, how we might be able to move towards more sustainable management. Uh, next. So Lenny Conoco did a fantastic work on compiling data from regional models and monitoring data of the aquifers throughout the US. And uh, this, is, uh, th this represents the results of his analysis based on data from 19, uh, modeling from 1900 to, to, to 2008. And uh, he estimated a total depletion of about a thousand cubic kilometers. And um, this represents a, a large subsurface reservoir uh, that we could use for storage for managed aquifer recharge. And uh, that compares to current US dam capacity of about 736 cubic kilometers. Uh, so here you can see uh, that uh, Dr. Conoco identified large depletion in the Central Valley in California, 105 and 45 cubic kilometers, um, Arizona alluvial basins 100, and two and uh, the High Plains region 340 and the Mississippi alluvial basin 180 uh, cubic kilometers. Uh, slide rises in storage in the Northwest, the Columbia and uh, the Snake 40 cubic kilometers and uh, slide depletions along the coast uh, uh, here. So this um, uh, provides uh, long-term uh, data on uh, water storage depletion in these aquifers, mostly in the Southwest, South Central US. Uh, next slide. So uh, we've been looking at uh, the GRACE satellite data for the first mission based on 15 years of data, 2002 uh, through 2017, and Ashraf Rata published this work in water resources research. Uh, so over this much shorter time frame, then you can see depletion in the uh, reds and yellows in the southwest and south central US about almost uh, 30 cubic kilometers in the Central Valley, slight depletion in Arizona, and uh, for almost 40 cubic kilometers in the Central and Southern High Plains. The yellow areas show very little change in storage uh, within the uncertainty envelope for the GRACE uh, data uh, in these uh, basins, the color, Upper Colorado and the Mississippi, and uh, then slight rise in storage in the Columbia and slight rises in storage in the humid Eastern US, Pennsylvania, and Florida aquifer systems. Um, next slide. So if we try to compare, we don't have data for the same time periods, but the GRACE data are shown on the left and uh, Kanaka's results for a much shorter time period, 2000 through 2008 are shown on the right. And in most basins there, they generally correspond, but the biggest uh, discrepancy is in the Mississippi alluvial basin, uh, where the GRACE data suggests very little change in storage, and the regional model suggests uh, minus uh, 60 cubic kilometer decline over this time period. 
And so we were working with the USGS on this study. And so they think that their um, regional model uh, may not be accurate enough and may not allow capture of surface water storage. And so they're, they're revising uh, that model now. And so even though a lot of hydrologists are allergic to GRACE data because they think it's too coarse resolution, I think it's just another uh, data source that we need to look at uh, when we're evaluating these systems. We can't ignore any uh, source of data. Uh, next slide. So now looking at the uh, direct and indirect impacts of climate and groundwater storage using uh, the uh, GRACE data. Next. So um, we looked at total water storage from Grace, and this example shows the southern central valley, San Joaquin Tulare, and you can see, and on the lower um, bottom part of the graph, we showed the US drought monitor data. So a drought from 2007 through 2009, and then 2012 through 2017, or 2017. And uh, the Grace uh, data corresponds to this. So we see declines in storage during the drought and large decline during the recent drought with a correlation coefficient between uh, the total water storage and the drought monitor data of 0.91. Um, so uh, this uh, may reflect the direct and indirect impacts of uh, climate extremes on water storage. Uh, next slide. So uh, next slide. So we, I just talked about uh, the uh, Central Valley and, and the relationship between, with the US drought monitor. In the Northern High Plains, we also see a strong relationship between total water storage and uh, drought uh, with increasing storage uh, during the non-drought periods and declines during the uh, flash drought in 2011-12. Um, but an overall increase in storage and uh, this uh, trend is not uh, projected to continue because it re just reflects large interannual variability. In contrast, the central and southern high plains shows a decline in storage that's amplified during the drought, but overall um, groundwater pumpage exceeds recharge all of the time, and so basically mining the groundwater in this system. Uh, next slide. Uh, and in the um, Mississippi uh, Embayment Regional Aqua System, then we see increases and decreases in response to drought, but not very much. Uh, uh, the drought is not very intense in this humid region in the US. And so um, storage, there's no long-term storage decline uh, seen. Uh, next slide. So uh, in addition to the relationships between uh, climate uh, directly and water storage, we also need to consider the impacts of irrigation on uh, water storage. And so here you can see the major irrigated areas, the Central Valley and the High Plains and the Mississippi Embayment and the uh, Northwest. Uh, next slide. So in the Central Valley, we saw a strong correlation between uh, total water storage uh, change and uh, drought. But this uh, partially reflects the fact that during 2010, which was a wet year, uh, most of the irrigation was from surface water, about 70% uh, was from surface water and about 30% from groundwater. And in the middle of the drought in 2015, they switched from predominantly surface water to mostly 70% groundwater. Uh, so this change in human water use then for irrigation amplified the impacts of drought in, in the Central Valley. And Claudia Font has been reporting this uh, for many years based on her regional modeling analysis. Uh, next slide. So um, many people, uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in the Central Valley and all the groundwater pumpage that occurs there, particularly during drought. But it's, it was interesting to me to see that groundwater pumpage in the Mississippi um, regional aquifer system actually exceeded that in the Central Valley. And uh, there wasn't really any intense droughts during this time period. But in this humid region, then that groundwater pumpage is uh, essentially capturing uh, water from either surface water or evapotranspiration. And so we're not seeing a large decline in storage. And hopefully the new regional model will be able to uh, confirm this. Um, so it's a combination then of climate impacts and uh, human water use. Next slide. So just a, one example then, and I'm sure in the case studies, they'll be talking much more detail about this. Um, this is uh, Arizona and uh, the Central Arizona project uh, shown in yellow, uh, bringing water from the Colorado River to these active management areas in Phoenix, uh, Pinal and Tucson. And uh, next slide. 
Um, and, uh, and these show the uh, spreading basins uh, used for managed after recharge in these areas, in these active management areas. Next slide. Uh, and these green basins don't have access to surface water. And next I'll show the uh, groundwater level hydrographs uh, in these different basins. So next slide. Uh, so in the areas where we have the active management areas, we see increases in uh, groundwater levels uh, over time or stable or rising, slightly rising water levels over time that can be attributed to surface water irrigation, uh, which accounts for about half of it, and then those managed after recharge basins, which accounts for the other half. Uh, next slide. And in the basins that don't have any access to surface water or Central Arizona Project water, we see uh, continual declines in water storage uh, in these uh, basins. Um, next slide. So how can we uh, move towards more sustainable water management? Next slide. Um, so I think uh, some of the analysis that we have been looking at um, show the importance of conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater. And I recall Claudia Font mentioning many years ago that when we are irrigating with surface water, maybe we could do it inefficiently as long as it doesn't impact the surface water resources. So we take into account the recharge, aqua recharge that's occurring as a result of that. Whether it's managed aqua recharge and flood managed aqua recharge, like Helen Dolphy, I'm sure we'll be talking about, or it just happens and it's unintentional. Um, a recent study in Northwest India shows a net increase in water storage from canal irrigation in the last century of about um, 350 cubic kilometers, even though most of the studies recently have been talked about the depletion during the GRACE record. Um, and then when we're irrigating with groundwater, because we're putting water direct from storage, it's important that that is uh, efficient in drip irrigation and those sorts of systems. And to manage up for recharge is a very important uh, tool to increase resilience at the local scale. And in cases like the high plains where we don't have any surface water, we just need very efficient groundwater and acknowledge that we're mining the groundwater. Uh, so next slide. So this uh, work, a lot of this work was uh, uh, you, during a power research group uh, meetings and we had uh, meetings every summer and really appreciate all the uh, inputs from the various uh, uh, contributors to that work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a, a very engaging talk. Um, I think we have a, a couple of minutes for questions. Please, yes. Thank you for your talk, um, Bridget. I have a quick question. What's the relationship between soil structure and some of these dynamics you see? Because, for example, I wonder in Mississippi, they're using a lot of groundwater. I'm wondering if it's like less evaporation, more recharge due to the soil structure versus some of the other areas that are depending on groundwater. And I also wonder um, in, the, in Arizona, when you looked at groundwater uh, change, level changes, did you, um, you mentioned there might be because of irrigated agriculture. I'm wondering if you have tested that hypothesis or is it more, uh, I wonder what percentage of that is mostly because of managed aquifer recharge instead of irrigated agriculture. Um, so uh, the first question about soil structure, I think that's very important uh, for the um, recharge. And I think we see this in the high plains. I mean, the northern high plains in Nebraska, uh, you've got the sand hills and you have a very high recharge, natural recharge. And then you also have some surface water irrigation from the plat. In the central and southern high plains, I mean, in parts of Texas, it's like cement. And, uh, but you do have some plyo recharge. So soil structure is uh, very important. And I think the USGS in their new regional model of Mississippi, they're going to be, do, they have been doing uh, geophysics to see the linkage between uh, the uh, rivers and uh, the uh, uh, subsurface and the aquifers, the shallow aquifers and, and trying to determine the, the linkages there and how they may be inducing recharge from different areas. Um, and then your second question on Arizona, Don Poole was involved in uh, that uh, study we were looking at Arizona, 
and uh, they have regional models of um, uh, the groundwater system and uh, uh, they were able to see, I think, from the surface water recharge and also from the water counting that uh, the Central Arizona project, um, much of that water was also used for flood irrigation and, um, you know, part of it was used in the uh, recharge basins. So the flood irrigation from surface water contributed quite a bit to the increased groundwater levels. And we saw it in the models and the data and uh, Don Poole had ground-based gravity data to show that also. Um, and uh, the Mar Basin, we were able to look at those impacts locally. So I hope uh, that answered your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. We are gonna to need to move on to the next speaker, but um, we, we, there will be time to answer questions for Bridget in the Q&A discussion at, towards the end of this open session. So I'd like to introduce Bill Alley, who is the uh, Science and Technology Director at the National Groundwater Association and was previously the Chief of the Office of Groundwater at the US Geological Survey. He's published widely, including several general interest environmental science books. Bill. Okay, thank yours. you. My pleasure to be here. And I guess I, my job is to give you an introduction to manage Dr. Recharge. Uh, here's an, uh, this particular uh, picture is of the uh, Montebello uh, Four Bay area above LA. Um, these spreading basins shown here off, the, that's the LA's idea of a river there, that concrete channel. Um, the spreading basin's been operating since the 1930s where they were recharging stormwater. In the 1950s, uh, they started in recharging, adding also imported water from the Colorado River. And 60 years ago, they started using uh, recycled wastewater, uh, recharging that. So it's, that's the oldest potable reuse uh, uh, project in the United States. Uh, in, in 2019, they actually took themselves off imported uh, water from, from anywhere in California. They had a program they called WIN, uh, which is Water Independence Now, uh, and they've managed to, uh, to take themselves off imported water, which is very important for this particular year if they can, they can continue. Uh, and the Los Angeles plans to basically recycle all of its wastewater at some point in the future. Okay, let's see if I can advance this. So there's a couple ways to, um, hopefully that'll disappear on the screen there. There's a couple ways that you can deal with uh, groundwater overdrafts. One is to replenish the aquifer, uh, which is the Mar idea, but there are also demand management and alternative supplies. So it's really working together with those three basic ways of trying to, to control the amount of water in an aquifer. Okay, so I think there's a delay here. So there's a purpose. So we tend to think of storage as a purpose of, of managed aquifer recharge, uh, but actually they're also used for environmental benefit, for halting land subsidence, for preserving wetlands, and. Uh, and managing the reuse of treated wastewater, as well as uh, providing possibly a local emergency water source for fire control or loss of water supply during storms. So there are a lot of different purposes of managed dive for recharge. Now there's a very, um, okay, lots of names out there. Uh, so originally it was referred to as uh, artificial recharge and that term carries on today. Uh, most people involved in managed aquifer recharge prefer not to use that term. They want to emphasize the management because the idea is the purposeful uh, recharge of water either for uh, later withdrawal or for environmental benefit. But there are a lot of other terms. Another one you hear a lot is aquifer storage and recovery, uh, which I'll get into in a moment. And that actually is a specific type of, of uh, managed aquifer recharge, but it's often used as a synonym for, for managed aquifer recharge. And then I'll skip down to the bottom, to the next to last there, managed underground storage of recoverable water. That was a term invented by the National Academy of Sciences in their last report, but it just tends not to be, tends not to be used. And one can also think of in lieu recharge as related to our uh, managed aquifer recharge in the sense that you are not withdrawing, using surface water supplies during, uh, and letting your aquifers recharge during, during wet periods. So let's look at some different types of MAR. Uh, so there's water spreading. Uh, the top one, an infiltration pond or spreading basin is, for I just showed you example on the introductory slide, but there are other types. Uh, in the Netherlands, they do dune filtration. Uh, 
one that's received a lot of interest is for a long time is is taking wastewater and using essentially spreading basins to to mostly purify the water from pathogens and to deal with nutrients is the main purpose there it's been studied probably all where herman bauer back in the 1960s in in arizona so there are also recharge wells uh aqua storage re and recovery is actually where you use the same well or wells for recharge and recovery and it's a little different because you can actually use brackish aquifers that way and build up a, a freshwater uh, bubble, if you will. Um, and so it's a very, it should be used as a specific term. So to distinguish that, sometimes in text, you'll see the term aquifer storage transfer and recovery, um, which is help, helpful to show the distinction, but there's not a recharge project in the United States where somebody's recharging wells and they would say, I'm doing aqua storage transfer and recovery. They would tell you they're doing well injection or what have you. So it's kind of a not term used much. And there's uh, also dry wells. And I'll actually get to an example of that uh, later. And then finally, there's stream bed channel modifications. These are typically done on ephemeral streams, uh, either where you build a dam and, and capture water behind it for the express purpose of recharging the aquifer. Uh, and using it down, down gradient. Or if you have a low uh, distance to an impermeable, uh, relatively impermeable unit, you might build a dam, underground dam to pond water, or you might actually build up gradually a series of dams and, and, and make your own aquifer, if you will. Um, because these are used a lot in, uh, for example, a place like India. And in fact, India recharges more water than anywhere else in the world. The United States is second, but India is far out in, in, in number one slot on that. They also use more groundwater than anybody else. And uh, another, uh, in terms of uh, future use, approximately 1% of the groundwater withdrawals uh, today are recharged through managed act for recharge means. So there's a lot of potential out there. Oh, finally, uh, there's also bank filtration. This is often used as a pretreatment technique, particularly in places like Berlin and Hungary, but also in the US. And I'll get to an example of that, where you're using essentially put a well maybe a couple hundred yards from a stream and you're uh, pulling the water from the stream and it's naturally cleansing itself um, and it's been shown to be pretty effective in certain types of chemicals and not so effective in others. So what are the advantages? Um, well, um, one is what most people think of immediately is the reduced evapotranspiration losses, but there's also a smaller impact on land use uh, and also avoids water quality problems such as algal blooms. A very important part of it is it can be scaled up over time. And actually there's reasons for scaling them up over time, uh, which I'll get to later. Uh, generally requires lower capital investment and it's adaptable to different situations as I've already discussed. So Bridget included this. I included this in case Bridget didn't show this figure. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip it. Okay, so what are some of the issues and challenges? Uh, one is regulatory complexity. Uh, wells, injection wells are uh, regulated by the underground injection control, uh, part of the Safe Drinking Water Act amendments. Um, and there are, are state and local jurisdictions that deal with things like water rights and so forth. So there could be a, it can be a, a difficult thing to get one of these projects going. Uh, there, for smaller users, there are financial and scientific challenges. Uh, the lack of certainty about water rights and recovery, and I know you'll hear more about that tomorrow uh, as a challenge. Uh, data limitations, uh, chemical re reactions of recharged water would act for materials, think arsenic, but there are other issues. Um, variability of source water quality, if you're using something like storm water, has a highly variable uh, water quality characteristics to it, as can surface water. Uh, and you need to improve groundwater governance and management, really. And then basically, you have to deal with well clogging. It's almost assured. And well clogging can occur in different time scales in different ways. This just shows a number of those where there are gas bubbles or abundant, or you may have bacterial growth that may depend on the, essentially the food supply for the bacteria, or you just may have a gradually increasing suspended sediment clogging your well. So those all have to be dealt with in whatever, in either well injection or in spreading basins. So let's take a simplified aqua storage recovery system here, same well pumping and withdrawing or recharging and withdrawing, uh, some monitoring wells around it. Um, and it has, you have to think in terms of various operational phases. So with recharge, you need a sufficiently permeable aquifer uh, that you have and without overpressuring it. For storage, 
that depends on the time frame. So these may be seasonal, long term, or short term, and so or maybe to optimize permitted water rights and surface water rights. Um, so the aquifer transmissivity and gradient should be such that the recharged water is going to remain close enough to the point of recharge that you can recover it. So that's an issue with longer term issues. And then recovery, uh, water quality becomes a big issue on, on the water quality side of things. And typically, these projects, as I mentioned, are staged. You start with a sort of a design. Uh, you might have a pilot and a demo project, particularly with a, with a, with a wet recharge well. Uh, you've got permitting and stakeholder involvement that may come that come into play here, and so it's a gradual process. And oftentimes, uh, so there have been projects where where they've decided to just go full steam ahead right from the beginning, and they've had problems. So, what are some research questions? Um, well, I list a number of them there. Uh, I'll point out the uh, introduce micro contaminants. So PFAS is, is a big deal these days. Um, but there are others, there's still the issues of, of pathogens, disinfection byproducts, either forming or being injected into wells, uh, what's going to happen to them, uh, monitoring techniques, applications of geophysics, and just to show you an example there, uh, they can be applied to surface spreading for identifying storage zones and recovery well field locations. And I know that you've probably all heard about airborne electromagnetics uh, at one time or another, you will probably by tomorrow. Um, which is very, which is being done on a big scale uh, in California, uh, with aquifer storage and recovery. Um, you can do it for you need storage zones and potential for mixing. Uh, again, there's a whole range of geophysical techniques, and finally, you can do thermal logging to monitor wells during recharge trials. So there's a lot of there's a lot of tools that are out there that can be applied to manage aquifer recharge um, in various ways. Okay, so I'm gonna end with focus on potable reuse projects. Um, and I'm gonna, I can't stop myself from passing around a book that my wife and I just published a month ago. This is totally on this topic. It's a fascinating topic. This is an EPA map. It's actually a little out of date, 2017, but all those blue dots are uh, indirect potable reuse. They're not all groundwater. Some of them are surface water, such as uh, Gwinnett County and the uh, Occoquan, not far from here. But you can see there's a lot of them and there's a lot in California and along the coast uh, for good reason. So with National Research Council has actually looked into potable reuse uh, back in, 19, actually a previous report, but in 1998, there's a book about this thick. It, it has a 12 page or so executive summary Embedded in that summary somewhere are the words, indirect potable reuse is an option of last resort. Uh, it shows up one other place in the report. There's nothing else in that report that ever really mattered. <laughs> so that became a, a, a real red flag for a lot of people, uh, uh, unfortunately. And it was still a developing technology really at the point. And they made the, in, in, the, in the report, uh, which is a fine report, made that point. Uh, in 2012, it was looked at again by another academy group this time they, they compared the uh, chemical and biological risks of, of, of uh, uh, a potable reuse with the, uh, what's in uh, a uh, de facto de de water reuse, if you will, uh, normal situation. And they basically concluded that, that the chemical risks are about the same maybe, and the microbial may be even better, it might be even better uh, to do the potable reuse. So. Uh, it's, it's come a long ways in, uh, in, a, in a couple decades. The book I'm passing around, I'm going to give you three examples from it. Um, uh, one is Monterey One Water, which is a classic case of the application of the one water idea. Uh, Scottsdale, Arizona is, I'll mention that mainly from a dry well, and Aurora, Colorado as an interior, uh, very uninteresting uh, study. So if this is the Monterey, you see Monterey there, the Monterey Peninsula, and the orange area shown is the Salinas Valley, otherwise known as the salad capital of the world. Uh, it also has had seawater intrusion uh, from pumping for that, uh, all the leafy stuff uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, it had, it's this, uh, it, a, to, undertook an 11 year study of application of tertiary treated wastewater to food crops eaten raw. Uh, it was a classic study and eventually in 1998, they started irrigating, they built a regional wastewater treatment plant and started irrigating 
12,000 acres uh, with tertiary treated water. Um, and so that was a setting for another problem that existed in Monterey, which is the people and businesses. There's not enough water. Uh, they're drawing water from the Carmel River, which you'll see south of, the, of there, and from a seaside groundwater basin, a really small groundwater basin. And they've been told for years to, to cease and desist on the Carmel River, or at least reduce their flows because of the damage to environmental, uh, uh, environmental issues, salmon, et cetera. Um, and so they started Monterey One Water, or Pure Water Monterey, uh, just came online maybe a couple years ago. This is a diagram of it. So they have four sources of water, uh, wastewater, uh, industrial processing water from washing that leafy vegetables, um, crop drainage water, and urban stormwater runoff. And they're able to essentially either direct that to tertiary treatment for application at the top there to their seawater um, project uh, with the 12 to 12,000 acres, or they can put it through the advanced water purification process that they use typically in California for well injection, it's injected in wells where it has maybe um, a nine to 12 month um, uh, residence time and then pull it out for, for use uh, by businesses and residences. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a landmark case of the application of one, of one water. Scottsdale Water Campus, uh, interestingly enough, uh, is actually a collaboration between 23 golf courses and the city of Scottsdale. Uh, and they use dry wells uh, because they're about 500 feet to water. So they use advanced treated wastewater for uh, recharging those dry wells. And they then um, uh, use the water during the wet season. Uh, they can uh, put it, it injected underground through those dry wells. And during when the irrigators need it, they can uh, send the water up for irrigating uh, in crops. And, and, the, and the, the golf courses pay part of the cost of this whole operation. So, and it's worked very well uh, over time. Finally, uh, Aurora, Colorado. Uh, it's a very interesting case of most of the South Platte rivers downstream from Denver in certain times of the year is actually treated wastewater from uh, uh, the wastewater treatment plant. And they pick it up further downstream, use the bank filtration process that I, that I mentioned, pump it 26 and a couple other things and pump it back to, back to Aurora uh, where they treat it with advanced techniques and then provide it uh, for drinking water. Uh, and they've been doing that since about 2010, I think. And interestingly enough, there's a whole nother story where they're actually sharing this capability and their capacity with, with the, uh, South metro areas, which are all depend mostly dependent on the Denver Basin Aquifer, um, so it's been a very successful, uh, very successful uh, project. It doesn't get as much press as some of the other managed aquifer recharge projects do. Finally, a couple things about uh, I've mentioned the U.S., but there's a lot of managed aquifer recharge around the world. This is a recent report um, uh, that was just uh, by UNESCO, uh, looking at 28 managed aquifer recharge schemes around the world, including some in the United States. Very interesting report. Um, and then finally, I'll end there with just a few references. I mentioned the first and the third on the list there. Uh, we also, there's also uh, uh, under the John Cherry's Groundwater Project, uh, an introduction intended as an introduction to aquifer recharge has become much more and much more very heavy heavy on the uh, governance management and governance side probably will be coming out soon this year as a as a joint publication of of the of IAH UNESCO and the National Groundwater Association and finally uh, we at NGWA are planning a special issue of groundwater we're almost there it's like herding cats but I think we've almost got all the authors uh, and that's planned for 2022. Thank you very much, Bill. That was a, a really uh, wonderful introduction to the topic today. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. And uh, so those in the room, raise your hand on Zoom, um, and then we'll have questions in questions and, and uh, answer. Uh, Bob or Robert? Yes. Uh, thanks, Bill, for that presentation. You made a particular note of the comment, the, the line in the 1998 Academy study, indirect potable reuse is an option of last resort. If somebody said, Bill, would you rewrite that 
what, what would you say? I would say that um, indirect potable reuse, uh, first of all, let's start separate the two from direct, uh, is a, a fairly advanced um, technology and it's used in many places. Uh, there are many cautions, you don't just jump into it. You, you, uh, you, need to, you need to make sure you've got like the sewer shed idea where you try to control the chemicals that people are injecting into the sewer system in the, in the first place. There's operator training. So it's not something that a small, that it's easy to jump into, but um, it's something that people should be planning for in a measured way, I'd say in a small way. Um, that's what I would say to them. Uh, direct potable reuse is becoming very popular, which is where you don't have the intervening aquifer or the uh, surface water reservoir. Scottsdale, Arizona is the third place city in the United States that's received uh, essentially the go ahead for doing direct potable reuse, but they don't plan to do it because they like the aquifers for storing the water for when they need it. Um, so that's one of the downsides of direct potable reuse. There's only one city in the United States, Big Spring, Texas, that does that now, but there's a lot of interest. There's been a lot of pilot studies around the country on that. Jonathan, or John, I... I'll figure this out. Uh, Bill, thank you for this overview. Uh, quite comprehensive. And uh, noting the, the title of one of the texts coming out in terms of governance and internationally, uh, can you identify anything without, um, you know, unless you just need to remain quiet until it's published, but are there any aspects of governance that uh, in, here in, the, you know, domestically we there are some things we could learn from that other countries are doing that we just haven't brushed against yet. Yeah, so a couple of interesting things. First of all, the UNESCO document that was published, they actually did um, an interesting thing. They came up with indicators of sustainability uh, for the projects and they evaluated with them. They actually based it on an EPA uh, uh, report or methodology for, for that. So um, that's one, I think, thing people need to think about the long term. Uh, there. Um, the other part uh, in the document that I mentioned, the IAH, UNESCO, NGWA, um, there's, there is a lot that's been done by uh, Australia also in governance, Peter Dillon in particular, but others. Um, and there they kind of divide up, they, they kind of look at it um, depending on where you are development wise, in terms of how you proceed forward with uh, trying to to, uh, to, to manage, the, manage the situation. But there, there are, it, it's very case dependent, of course. Um, but there are a lot of issues to think about in terms of, you know, what if you uh, recharge an aquifer that's been dry for a while and all of a sudden you have springs just showing up um, in somebody's backyard that bought a house that was dry. So, so you have to think a lot about what's gonna happen to that, to that water and what it, how it might change the environment uh, along the way. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, I know you have a question and then there's actually one that I'm gonna follow up for you. So Bridget. Um, thanks, um, fantastic presentation, Bill. Um, one question in the Aurora case, you said the water table is about 500 feet deep. How deep are the dry wells? And is that a recharge actually reaching the aquifer? I know Claudia Font in California sometimes questions the spreading basins and if they're actually recharging the aquifer that's being pumped, um, you know, when the wells that are pumping are much deeper. So just yeah. maybe. So that was Scottsdale, Arizona, actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And so there's about 500 feet of water. The dry wells are about 180 feet uh, down. So you, they've got, you know, another 300 feet. Um, it, what's interesting, their water levels have gone up, um, and actually, as you may know, I, I know you know, Bridget, but others here may know, the um, Arizona has set a uh, safe yield, uh, what they define as safe yield, where in other words, you don't pump any more than you recharge, um, and Scottsdale was the first city in uh, Arizona to actually achieve that goal, which is 
which is a goal set for 2025, but they they said it some years ago. So I'm I'm guessing it's fairly effective, um, Bridget. Thanks. Okay, and before I go to your question, Bridget, um, I did want to comment that Sharon Megdal uh, said that she'll be uh, providing a link to the UNESCO book that was just referred to in her presentation tomorrow. Uh, so Bridget, um, is there a model like the USGS basin characterization model for California available for other states? Well, USGS uh, originally had the RASA program and Bill could probably uh, speak to this uh, more directly, but now they have regional models in many areas uh, and they, they continually update them. So uh, yes, there are models in many regions. Uh, Texas has the, uh, its own modeling program, the groundwater availability modeling, and they have models for most of the aquifers in, in Texas, including the uh, Ogallala or High Plains aquifer. So Bill, do you want to add to that? Uh, the only thing I'd add is you'd be amazed how many groundwater models there are out there. <laughs> and they don't always agree with one another. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a, a question that I think uh, from the audience that I think both of you could probably address. What are the spatial time and uh, spatial scale and temporal lead times at which recharge technologies are considered successful water management operations? So either of you want to take that? I'll start. Uh, actually, the person you want to talk to is Sharon Megdal tomorrow, since you have her on the line there. She's the, uh, she can help you a lot also with your governance questions, for sure. Um, you know, some of it depends on the, on the time scale of the use. So in Florida, you may be injecting water uh, underground uh, for use um, the next season. Um, and so your, your time scale is that, is that particular season. If you're in Charleston, South Carolina, you may actually be putting it underground because you've had an earthquake and floods there and you want to have an emergency source of water. So it's going to be there for a very long time. Um, the Arizona situation is interesting because they have been, as shown by uh, Bridges' uh, work, they've been recharging a lot of water. And now, as you well know, it looks like they're going to need it. But the question is, where is that water now and how do you, how do you extract it? Um, maybe just add a little bit, I mean, Arvin Edison, one of the basins that has been doing it since the 1960s, uh, they tried to store enough water for the, the multi-year droughts that they have, you know, so they're putting it in continually when it's a wet period and then um, all of the wells are pumping during the drought 24-7, 365, so um, until they can't, I guess. <laughs> Neil, yeah. I think you had a question. I'm having a hard time <laughs> using the mic and looking at the speaker both at the same time. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So um, I think in, in the southwestern U.S., one of the implications of climate change over the next 50 years is that we will expect more extreme precipitation events. And I think in, in say, for example, in New Mexico, we know roughly what part of the state is likely to get more extreme precipitation, but we don't know exactly, obviously, where that's going to happen. Do you have any comments about how, how uh, methods for capturing water associated with extreme precipitation events in an ASR context? So I know tomorrow you have Helen Dalkey on the schedule, and I'm sure she's going to talk about the, a very large effort in California called Floodmar. Um, that's trying to, and, and actually learning how to operate reservoirs uh, better to make, take maximum advantage of them for recharging the water while you have it. Uh, um, you know, in New Mexico, you know, you've got major water issues, especially down in El Paso. Uh, and El Paso, by the way, is the first city in the United States to have actually used wells for injection of potable reuse back in 1885. And they have they're continuing to expand their program. They're one city that's actually going to be the largest city in the US that has a sizable direct potable reuse program probably within the next 10 years. So, so it's, it's a big deal. Okay, thank you. We are right on time. There are some uh, additional questions and I'm gonna encourage people mm -hmm. to um, bring those up in the Q&A discussion in a little while. So thank you to both of our speakers. And now I'm going to, um, you're going to hear from a series of case studies. 
uh, presentation, presentations moderated by John Arthur, the ex-director for the American Geosciences, Inst executive director <laughs> <laughs> for the American Geosciences Institute. You didn't know that. <laughs> and the previous... <laughs> Not yet. Getting punchy already. Previous state geologist of Florida and director of the Florida Geological Survey. And he's a member of the Water Science and Technology Board. John. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for reinstating me so quickly. So uh, in this next session, Managed Act for Recharge case studies, uh, there are abundant applications as we just heard for MAR. And today we're going to hear from six geoscientists and engineers with experience in these various systems from across the country. Through their unique lens, we will hear case studies, successes, caveats, lessons learned, and uh, not only in relation to system design, but also operation management, as well as scientific and engineering considerations that are shaped by local hydrogeology and regulatory requirements. And with that, uh, we'll start with our first of our 15 minute presentations with Dr. Charles Bott, who is the Director of Water Technology and Research at Hampton Roads Sanitation District. He manages technology innovation and research and development at the district's 16 wastewater treatment plants. And he is also adjunct professor at the Department of Departments of Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering at Virginia Tech and Old Dominion University. So Charles, please tell us about Virginia and the Eastern Shore. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, well, I, I, I think that the, the, the slate of speakers for these case studies is in alphabetical order. I, I feel a little nervous about um, speaking ahead of Orange County Water District and the groundwater replenishment system, which is of course very well known um, and, and many, many years, light years ahead of what we're doing at HRSD. Um, so anyway, this is our SWIFT Research Center a demonstration facility for um, indirect potable reuse and managed aquifer recharge. And I'm gonna tell you a little more about our uh, study here, our work here. Um, this has been going on now for um, about five years. We're into the SWIFT program, but, but first a bit about HRSD. We serve about 1.8 million people in Southeast Virginia and operate uh, about eight medium to large plants and eight or so smaller plants with a combined capacity of 225 MGD. Um, the status of water in Hampton Roads is that, uh, is that approximately 20% is supplied by groundwater, about 80% of the population is supplied by surface water. As we move west in our service area, there's much more reliance on groundwater than surface water and more reliance on surface water um, at, in the east. Um, we treat wastewater to now um, really high standards because we discharge mostly into the Chesapeake Bay watershed, so we've been upgrading treatment plants over the last 20 years for much more su substantial um, nitrogen and phosphorus removal. So as we contemplated our future, one of the considerations was we treat to really high standards and we effectively take this resource and we discharge into salt water um, and, and sort of throw that resource away. And it was bothering us. And five or six years ago, we, we really um, started to think about this. And over the course of a few years of study and, and, and piloting and careful work, we um, developed the, the SWIFT program, which involves adding advanced treatment and managed aquifer recharge. And there are a number of benefits for that. First of all, the Hampton Roads area is second only to New Orleans in terms of population and infrastructure at risk of sea level rise. And about half of our observed sea level rise is due to land subsidence. So perhaps managed aquifer recharge uh, has the opportunity to, to reduce the rate of land subsidence. Perhaps provides us some regulatory stability by taking our water quality sort of to an endpoint in terms of drinking water quality. Um, it further reduces our nutrient loads into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it protects the area uh, and the Potomac Aquifer from groundwater, uh, saltwater intrusion and provides a sustainable supply of groundwater. So the Potomac Aquifer um, is under uh, pressure of uh, extraction and has been for many years. Uh, on the left shows um, critical surface violations in the Potomac Aquifer over a 50 year simulation. The green dots are our treatment plants and this shows a look after 50 years of recharge at these plants of substantial rebound in pressure. So in this case, I'll just make clear that the travel times in the aquifer 
are, are thought to be quite long from these treatment plants. You know, it's more than 100 years for a mile of, tr of transport through the aquifer. So SWIFT is really about repressurizing the aquifer and, and ensuring that the, that, that the uh, pressures in the aquifer remain sustainable, uh, along with the other drivers I just talked about. So the SWIFT goal for, first of all, the, on the left is our uh, larger treatment plants um, treating about 150 million gallons per day. The SWIFT goal is 100 million gallons per day. By 2032, uh, several large capital projects I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Um, this star Chesapeake Elizabeth treatment plant has already been shut down, shifting flow to Atlantic treatment plant. The Atlantic treatment plant is our one ocean discharge plant. It's too far east in the Potomac aquifer to really be useful, and it will never be a SWIFT plant by our current planning. It, in fact, also not a nutrient removal plant, which is a big which is a big leap in order to get to SWIFT for our facilities. So we started, as I mentioned, about uh, five years ago with some pilot testing. We've scaled up now to our demonstration facility, our research center, and we're now uh, starting the build out. When we started this, we, we took some time to consider the advanced treatment approaches um, and broadly, and I think probably there will be more discussion on this, there are two general approaches. And the way I like to describe it is the top approach is basically a tricked out drinking water plant that might be treating water from a relatively contaminated surface water supply. Uh, and the bottom approach is what has been typically used in California involving ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, and UV advanced oxidation. So we set out about some pilot testing to uh, determine which of these approaches made sense for us. And we worked for quite a while and summarizing a lot of work in one slide to convince ourselves that ozone biofiltration GAC was equally uh, protective in terms of emerging contaminants uh, and pathogens. And we could routinely and easily meet primary maximum contaminant levels. But of course, there's no TDS removal. It turns out that the status of the Potomac Aquifer in the region where we're injecting is already uh, quite salty. And so to be sustainable in terms of, in terms of injection and being compatible with the geochemistry of the aquifer, we really need this TDS uh, for uh, sustainable recharge into the aquifer. Uh, recharging water that is you know, uh, uh, in the 50 to 100 milligram per liter TDS range is just not sustainable in this aquifer. At, this, at, this, at these locations. Uh, and that pilot work was done by a combination of HRSD staff and, and quite a few universities, I'm not naming all of them, but the major work by Virginia Tech, ODU, and University of Michigan. The other th thing that's going on in parallel, and I'm not going to spend much time talking about today, is, is gaining really uh, public and regulatory support in the region for SWIFT and within the state. Um, and, and EPA. In, in Virginia, uh, Virginia did not take delegated authority of, the under, of underground inject, injection control. Um, so our permitting authority is really EPA Region 3 um, through the underground injection control program. Three years ago, uh, we started up our SWIFT demonstration facility that we call our SWIFT Research Center. This is a 1MGD advanced treatment facility. Uh, we also have recharge wells and monitoring wells, which I'll talk about, uh, but it's also a public out, uh, outreach uh, location and public education facility. Uh, even at the 1MGD scale, we're, we're capable of making changes and modifying things in order to test new approaches. Uh, and we located it, this at a, a wastewater plant that's already a quite sophisticated wastewater plant, um, consistent with the best nutrient removal plants in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, so a five-stage Barton folk plant already doing really good nitrogen and phosphorus removal. The SWIFT Research Center process flow diagram is that ozone biofiltration approach, so coagulation with aluminum chlorohydrate, polymer addition, flocculation, sedimentation, ozonation, and then biofiltration. And the purpose of ozonation here is both emerging contaminant, uh, oxidation, pathogen disinfection, as well as um, oxidation of bulk organic carbon to make that organic carbon more biodegradable in the biofilter. Uh, the biofilter is operated like a drinking water filter with very stringent turbidity requirements. And then GAC, granular activated carbon adsorption for polishing of emerging contaminants um, like PFAS, for example, that aren't well removed upstream. Uh, UV disinfection, chlorine addition, and pH adjustment prior to recharge. Uh, so at the SWIFT Research Center, we have a couple of interesting features. One is a recharge well in a very closely located well to look at uh, soil aquifer treatment. 
Monitoring wells, which I'll talk about in a second, we partnered with USGS to install an extensometer to really measure uh, land subsidence and, and contraction, uh, I'm sorry, land subsidence and rebound as a result of, of just this 1 million gallon per day well. Um, we partnered with Virginia Tech to put in a network of, of seismophones to look at um, seismic activity as a result of recharge over the, over, over the future years. And so in cross section, this demonstration facility includes a recharge well located 50 feet away and three days travel time and screened in exactly the same uh, locations is a monitoring well with a flute sampling system that allows us to take discrete samples from the system. We see already a lot of soil aquifer treatment with three days of travel time and, um, and some interesting trends as a result of both organic and inorganic um, contaminant uh, transformation and removal through the aquifer. And then some months away is the is wells, a nest of wells located in the upper, middle, and lower Potomac. Um, the, the upper Potomac, the, the swift water has reached the upper Potomac aquifer. Um, it has also reached the middle Potomac, but not hasn't seemingly passed by completely, but it has not reached the lower Potomac. So there is some very significant differences in uh, preferential flow through the aquifer uh, with the with the the uh, more um, transmissible zones sort of uh, transporting more, more water. Uh, from a regulatory standpoint, um, uh, this is what the SWIFT Research Center is required to do and also our, for our for first full-scale facility, um, meeting all primary MCLs. It turns out that's pretty easy. We do that at the secondary effluent of the wastewater plant. Uh, total nitrogen five monthly, eight max day, not challenging for um, our wastewater plants, uh, but a critical control point effluent TIN, secondary effluent TIN less than five based on ammonia and NOx measurements that are online. So online measurement of TIN, uh, that's really challenging because it's effectively a 15 minute level of performance. Turbidity requirements consistent with drinking water, TOC of four, uh, maximum month, six maximum uh, any sample. Um, total coliform and E. coli requirements consistent with the groundwater standards in Virginia, but Treatment goals of 12, 10, 10 consistent with the California uh, requirements. No requirement for TDS so that we remain compatible with the aquifer and unregulated constituents are, are being handled very similar to other potable re reuse applications with two lists. One short list of contaminants that tell us something about the performance of the advanced treatment facilities, or advanced treatment processes, and another list that are the uh, compounds of, of, of concern and potable reuse, um, things that we know are um, concerning in these types of treatment systems like PFAS and 1,4-dioxane and NDMA and, and so on. So I mentioned the, the, the nitrogen removal uh, required. Um, this is something that at HRSD we're quite proud of and you know maybe in the end is more, um, more substantial and meaningful than SWIFT. Um, we are really excited that we've been able to deploy mainstream Anamox through the partial denitrification pathway. We're doing this at our York River treatment plant. We're in construction uh, right now at our James River treatment plant. And the benefits are just tremendous uh, in terms of making nitrogen removal stable and reliable and doing it in smaller and smaller and more intensified wastewater treatment plants. And this is really a requirement uh, if, we don't, um, if we don't pursue um, uh, reverse osmosis-based potable reuse. So a little bit about some advanced treatment uh, topics that we've been working on. So our current ozonation process uses preformed monochloramine to control bromate formation and high bromide secondary effluent. And that works quite well. We rely on ozone, as I mentioned, for both disinfection and oxidation. And ozone in wastewater really acts like an advanced oxidant because it very quickly decomposes to hydroxyl radical. The way preformed chloramine works is by partly shielding, it works in several ways, but one of the mechanisms is by partly shielding uh, and serving as a, as a sink for hydroxyl radicals. And so while preformed chloramine does a nice job of minimizing bromate formation, it also um, hurts us to some degree from the standpoint of oxidizing emerging, um, emerging contaminants. Hey, Charles, um, we've got about a minute. Okay, another possibility is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide enhances the removal of emerging contaminants, but it, it hurts us because we don't get CT credit for, um, for disinfection. Uh, 
while we know we actually do get disinfection with peroxide. Um, I'll just say quickly that from a biofiltration standpoint, we've learned a lot. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing some work on adding propane to the biofilters to enhance 1,4-dioxane removal. Uh, we've learned a lot about how these biofilters remove effectively NDMA, bully nitrify a little bit of ammonia. Um, this is a picture of those modifications to the full-scale filters. From a GAC standpoint, one of the questions that we get all the time is PFAS, and we've done a lot of work to look at both high molecular weight and low, low molecular weight PFAS, um, getting ourselves really comfortable that, that, we, that four milligram per liter TOC is really protective of low molecular weight PFAS compared with the most stringent regulations from around the world. Uh, and of course, we'd like to minimize GAC utilization. GAC is a big cost for the SWIFT program and really maximizing biological removal of TOC in the, in the GAC contactors is a real benefit, particularly in the summertime. So the build out looks like this. So the, the, the SWIFT facilities are shown here. Um, the James River plant is our first full scale SWIFT facility. It will be, we're in design for this facility. Right now we're at the 60% design for this facility. This is a project that's between 400 and 500 million dollar capital project. So a huge project for us. Um, and the James River uh, project um, is proceeding ahead uh, with the uh, EPA Region 3, um, hopefully very soon, hopefully within the next week or two, issuing our full-scale UIC permit for uh, public review, the draft permit for public review. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for an uh, excellent talk. And sounds like you've got a lot of, a lot of uh, balls to juggle there. Um, thank you. And we'll move on to our next speaker. Adam Hutchinson, and uh, so we'll flip over to the West Coast. Adam Hutchinson is the Recharge Planning Manager for the Orange County Water District in Southern California. He's responsible for testing and evaluating new methods to increase the capacity of existing recharge system and planning for future expansion of that recharge system and assisting recharge operations and developing optimization strategies. Adam. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, great to be with you. Uh, can we go ahead and put the uh, slide presentation up? So we're going to talk about Orange County Water District and our managed aquifer recharge system and what we can learn from that uh, next. So just to get everybody oriented in terms of where we are, we are in Southern California, not Orange County, Florida, but Orange County, California. Uh, we are in the Santa Ana River watershed, which is, covers over 2,500 square miles. Fortunately, we're at the bottom of the watershed, which has some good characteristics in terms of stormwater capture and receiving uh, water from the Santa Ana River. Uh, next, next slide. So why was the Orange County Water District formed? Well, back in the early 1900s, there was an explosion of agriculture in the area, hence the name Orange County, a lot of orange growing and other uh, crops being grown. And as a result, not surprisingly, we had a lot of groundwater overdraft. Uh, we had seawater intrusion. So the locals in Orange County at the time went to the state and said, we need to create an agency to manage the groundwater supply as well as protect the rights to the Santa Ana River, which were being diverted upstream of Orange County. So the Orange County Water District now provides water to 19 different cities and special water districts, and there's two and a half million people that rely on the groundwater supply in North and Central Orange County. Next slide, please. So in Orange County, uh, where do we get our water? So 75% of the water supplies uh, of those 19 different agencies is met with groundwater. And the cost of groundwater is $500 an acre foot. And we charge that fee for every acre foot of water pumped out of the basin. And the alternative, uh, the supplemental source of water is imported water. And the cost of that water is more than double. So we're $1,000 an acre foot. And that water comes from the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which gets imported water from Northern California and the Colorado River. So we have a strong financial incentive to obviously ma maximize the amount of groundwater available 
it not only benefits the region, but it benefits our producers directly from an economic standpoint. So next slide. So we have 200 wells that pump water out of the basin. And uh, all these wells have been metered since the 1950s. So we have a very good handle on our groundwater budget, what's being pumped, what's being recharged. And so that's a very important element in terms of allowing us to manage the basin properly. Next slide. So this is the cross section of the groundwater basin. It's a typical alluvial uh, system, a sedimentary basin of three different aquifer systems, like a layer cake, a shallow principal and deep aquifer. The uh, aquifers merge as you go inland toward the uh, canyon area. And that's where our surface water recharge facilities are located, where the water can easily percolate down through into these three different aquifers. If you try and do surface recharge as you move to the southwest, it won't work because of the subdividing layers or clay layers that start to create these three aquifer systems. Uh, next slide, see it drop in. So the basin itself contains a massive amount of water, 66 million acre feet of water, but obviously you can't withdraw all that water without causing a lot of problems. So our operating storage range that we actually try and keep the basin within is only 500,000 acre feet, which is still a substantial amount of water, but it only represents you know, less than 1% of the total storage in the basin. And so um, that's the operating range and we stay within it and it, it, uh, it works really well for us. So next uh, slide, please. So why do we do manage aquifer recharge? Well, going back to the 1930s when we were formed, the, the, the district really had a supply side approach. Uh, really, let's see what we can do and maximize what we have uh, available to us. So in the early stages, it was really about the capture and recharge of river water, the base flow as well as storm flow that were coming down to us. And then later as the imported water became available, we started recharging imported water and buying it. And then in the 70s, uh, with seawater intrusion, we built a barrier and to protect the basin from uh, seawater intrusion and replenish the basin as well. And then more recently, uh, recycling water has been a really key uh, element of our uh, water supply. Yet the reason to do managed aquifer recharge is to store water in the basin to get through drought periods. So take that water during the wet periods and bank it and get prepared for droughts. And, that's currently what we're in right now. We're in a dry period, and so basin storage is going to go down, but that's what that storage is for. And as I said earlier, it makes financial sense. Imported water is a very expensive alternative, so we have a very strong economic uh, signal to maximize our recharge program as much as possible. Next slide. So as I mentioned, since we've been formed, we've been developing our managed doctor recharge program. Uh, this map here shows the surface water basins that we have. We have 1,500 acres of land purchased starting in 1936 all the way to the present. Our little factoid on the right there is our first purchase of land in 1936 was $27 an acre. Our last purchase in 2013 was $1.6 million an acre. So uh, tremendous increase in land values in the area. If we were to try and build this system today, we could not afford to do it. So fortunately, we started a long time ago and uh, really lucky to have all that property under our belt. Uh, one thing I wanna highlight too in this map is if you look on the upper right, you see Prado Dam. Uh, that is the Army Corps of Engineers facility built in 1941. And we actually have a program with them to temporarily store stormwater behind that dam and let, let that storm water out slowly so we can recapture that water, and not leave it to the ocean. So next slide. So what I'm gonna show you here, a couple of uh, a picture and a figure. So number one, and you see that the arrow, that's gonna be a photograph looking to the Northeast at the Santa Ana River from the aerial view. And then number two is a figure I'm gonna show you of the annual recharge done in 2021 schematically a three-dimensional cartoon showing 
the amount of water that all these different facilities you see on the map were able to recharge in one calendar year. The next slide. So here is a aerial photograph of the Santa Ana River channel on the right. Uh, on the left is called the offer of the system. So you're looking to the north towards the canyon, towards Prado Dam. And so this is a very urbanized area and the river is really one of our best recharge facilities because it is very long and wide and it doesn't clog like the uh, recharge basins do. So it's really the backbone of our recharge system. The next slide here, I'll show you the actual recharge that was conducted in 2021. So you can see the river showed up as a long skinny line there, but it did uh, the most recharge of any facility in that particular year. And then the recharge basin show up uh, at those different columns popping up there. And in the foreground, the tallest one you see popping up there is our La Palma recharge basin that's only recharges recycled water. So it's a relatively small footprint, but the water is so clean and so pure that our recharge rates are far and ex ex exceed any other facility we have in our system. So we're really uh, glad to have that source of water for us. So next slide. So we do a lot of research and development to maximize the amount of recharge uh, we can get. Uh, clogging of our recharge basin is a key constraint. Uh, that's true of any managed doctor research system. You know, they all clog, just a matter of how quickly. Uh, for our recharge basin, the clogging layer is removed with heavy equipment. Uh, the technology there hasn't changed too much, but we are doing research to try and optimize that process. Uh, we did a lot of research in what we call basin cleaning vehicles, almost like a glorified pool cleaner that would go on the bottom of the basin and sweep up that clogging layer, which is just a really fine, silty clay type sediment that builds up in the bottom. Uh, that process did work. However, the ability to do it on a scale that made economic sense for us uh, did not work. Uh, we did a massive sediment removal testing project. We would look at all the different treatment technologies to remove suspended sediment from the river water. We found that adding any chemicals did not work. That would actually cause clogging on the back end, even if the turbidity levels were low. One of the systems that came out of this testing process was what we call riverbed filtration where we use the riverbed to filter out the suspended sediment. So it's like what Bill talked about earlier with river bank filtration. This is riverbed filtration where we're actually building a collection gallery of pipes about three feet under the riverbed, collecting that filtered water and conveying it to a recharge basin and let the sediment remain in the river where it gets washed downstream. So that's something we're seeing very good success with and we may expand that to a full scale here in the future. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we built a seawater intrusion barrier in the 1970s to protect the basin from seawater. Uh, we built over 30 injection wells. And what's really good about this is it not only protects the basin from seawater intrusion, but 95% of that water flows into the basin itself and becomes part of the water supply. So it's a really multi-benefit type of project. Next slide, please. So over the years, we've developed a really diverse water portfolio. Uh, these are different sources of water that we recharge into the basin and the percentages on average. And some of these are more uh, affected by weather, such as stormwater, for example, that's gonna be highly variable depending on local weather conditions. Imported water is less affected by local weather, but can be affected by regional weather conditions such as we have today, uh, extreme drought conditions and the water supplies are much lower. The uh, Santa Ana River base flow and recycled water are very reliable sources of water. They're very resilient. They're not as affected by climate change and other impacts. So we're really fortunate to have a diverse portfolio that can get us through uh, drought periods and uh, sustain our groundwater basin. So the next slide, please. So I'm sure many of you have heard about our groundwater replenishment system project that went online in 2008. 
This is a typical uh, California approach, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, with advanced oxidation process. Uh, 70 MGD plant was put online in 2008. Uh, we are currently underway in building the final expansion where we'll go up to 130 MGD next year. Uh, that will basically be the final because there's no more recyclable water to be had in our area. So we'll basically be recycling everything possible and all that water will either go into the barrier or up to our Anaheim spreading ground. Next slide. Adam, got about a minute. Thank you. Yeah, I'm almost done. So effort to create new supplies. Uh, we're looking at increasing the amount of stormwater we can do, uh, capture behind Prado Dam using forecasting form reservoir operation. We're operating the dam using forecast information rather than the old approach of water on the ground. Metropolitan looking at their own recycled water projects and we might participate in that. And then finally, uh, PFAS treatment uh, at the final bullet there. I wanted to quickly cover that. Next slide. Uh, just a little out of order here. So we talked about the diverse portfolio, also diverse water quality uh, sources. So base flow of the river, 700 TDS, all the way down to GWS water is under 100 milligram per liter TDS. But what's really interesting about our groundwater basin is because we have so much recycled water that's of such pure quality, we are actually reversing the salinity balance in our basin. We're gonna actually be freshening the basin over time rather than more uh, salinity level going up. So we'll be putting a paper together and publishing that uh, result in probably a year or so. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna wrap up with the PFAS. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, PFAS impacts to our basin. 60 of our 200 wells were taken offline. Uh, this is in the treat, uh, treated wastewater that we're receiving from upstream. Uh, PFAS levels are in that water and so it's caused us to have to do a massive wellhead treatment program. Uh, it's going to cost over a billion dollars long term. And so we are paying for this. We're going to go in and pay for these treatment systems and then the uh, utility to be on the hook for some of the O&M long term. So um, final slide next. I want to wrap up with, you know, Manus Aqua Recharge is central to our ability to manage our groundwater basin. This program has more than doubled or tripled the yield of the groundwater basin. The natural yield is 100,000 acre feet per year. If OCWD weren't doing anything, but the current yield is over 350,000 acre feet. We we'll continue to look for opportunities to increase supply for Spiro, recycled water, and just uh, protecting groundwater quality is going to be a continual challenge for MAR projects because PFAS wasn't on our radar several years ago, and now it's a uh, huge issue that we're having to address. And so um, sure as our technology uh, detection approaches get better, we're gonna continue to find more challenges in the future. So that's it, but keep us busy. So anyway, that concludes my presentation. I look forward to questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, very much. And we'll move on to Dr. June Marecki. And June comes to us uh, with a story from Florida. Uh, she's senior hydrogeologist with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and a licensed professional geologist in Florida. Um, she's a hydrogeochemist uh, and then some and serves as technical lead for the ASR projects or has served as technical lead for, you can correct me, June, uh, the okay. ASR pilot projects and the ASR regional study uh, related to the comprehensive Everglades restoration projects to increase water storage in Southern Florida and June, all yours. Thank you very much, John. Um, I apologize, I cannot get the camera to work on my federal laptop. So I'm, the wheel just keeps going round and round. So unfortunately you can't see me. <laughs> um, today I'd like to present um, a decided or a comparatively low tech approach to managed aquifer recharge, uh, specifically for ecosystem restoration. And th this project uh, at the Picayune Strand 
Ecological Restoration Project is part of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Next slide, please. Just one slide about uh, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan or SERP. Uh, this, this suite of projects, 64, 68 projects in total, is designed or was compiled and integrated to replumb Southern Florida, both from um, a surface water sheet flow and surface water groundwater interaction standpoint. Uh, the, the entire attempt is to allow a more natural but controlled for flood control purposes uh, movement and conveyance of surface and groundwater from the headwaters of the Kissimmee River Basin up north near Orlando, southward uh, through the Kissimmee River Basin and Lake Okeechobee, and then into uh, the areas south of Lake Okeechobee, including the Everglades National Park. The SERP is the acronym, and it is a compilation of 68 projects, of which the project I will discuss today is one of the first to come online. Uh, when all of these projects are implemented, uh, it will improve the volumes of water in storage. Uh, some of the projects will provide nutrient reduction by water treatment. Uh, it will provide a more natural rate of water conveyance from north to south and will enable um, and continue uh, water supply for ecosystem restoration purposes. Next slide, please. Now, the um, Picayune Strain Restoration Project uh, was one of the first ecosystem restoration projects to come online in SERP in the mid-2000s. Uh, the importance of the Picayune Strain Restoration Project, uh, it, it's located in um, western uh, Collier County and uh, toward the uh, city of Naples. Uh, it is a keystone to ecosystem restoration in this area. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, it was uh, proposed suburban development. Uh, the figure on the upper right shows that dark green area called the Southern Golden Glades Estates. But notice that that proposed uh, suburban development uh, is surrounded by uh, natural uh, wilderness areas, uh, state preserves, national preserves, national wildlife refuges. So this, this footprint is actually a keystone to ecosystem restoration of this entire area. In addition, it's the location of some of the big, important endangered species uh, in, in South Florida. And that includes uh, the uh, Florida panther, uh, the endangered wood storks, and there's even a feature for manatee restoration, uh, manatee uh, restoration also in uh, this area. The other important feature about the Picayune Strain Restoration Project is that it is the largest wetlands restoration project in all of SERP. It's 55,000 acres of re, uh, rehabilitated wetlands. The objectives for this project include, of course, wetland restoration and uh, habitat improvement, uh, improved hydro period of these wetlands to more mimic the natural wet dry season cycles, and finally, uh, what we're all interested in is aquifer recharge. Next slide, please. Now, the pre-project condition of the Southern Golden Glades or Southern Golden Gate Estates. Uh, this was a proposed suburban development and one of the largest at the time, suburban developments of all of the United States. And they proud, the developers proudly declared that this would be um, the giant machinery is creating a dream city of new out of virgin, uh, virgin territory. And they were quite proud of that. Well, the proposed development was uh, again, the 55,000 acre area, 19, almost 20,000 platted parcels roadways, drainage canals, culverts, 
and bridges and weirs for water flow conveyance. And what this resulted in was overdraining of this sensitive wetland area. And it's probably the basis of that, that, <laughs> that statement. If you wanna buy some, uh, I, I have some swampland in Florida to sell you because one of the failures of this develop, proposed development was the fact that during wet season flows, all of this area was under feet of water and the development was just, even with all the drainage activities, they could not develop it further. Next slide, please. Okay, so how, what, how will we restore this area, prevent the overdrainage of the wetlands, uh, promote wetland restoration and managed aquifer recharge? The components of the Picayune Strand Restoration Project, in, and again, these are low tech compared to the talks that you've just seen, uh, include the construction of three varying size pump stations, and you can see those along the top, the Merritt Pump Station, the Focke Union Pump Station, and the Miller Pump Station. Now, these are not just pump stations to convey water down canals. They are positioned near the existing canals, but these pump stations will work in conjunction with associated spreader features and canal plugs. And the three of these components, the pump station, spreader, and canal plugs will slow the flow, allow for the development of sheet flow over the surface, and um, allow for uh, a more natural hydro period for these wetlands. In addition to those pump station spreader canal plug systems, the, the project also includes 227 miles of road removal and also some flood protection uh, levees. These are actually small berms around private lands and agricultural lands to the south. Just uh, There's also a manatee uh, mitigation feature that allows uh, controlled water levels so that manatees can access the area and the canals to the, in the very southern part of the project area. So we have all these. The important thing here is the integration of pump stations, spreaders, and canal plugs. Next slide, please. And here we can see how these features work in conjunction. Uh, the first pump station to come online is the Merritt Pump pump station. And that came online in 2015 and started pump uh, conveying water in earnest uh, in 2016. Uh, if we look at that figure on the left side, you can see from north to south, you can see the existing Merritt Canal. And on the southern lower part of that of that photograph, the Google Earth photograph, you can see where the canal plugs are starting to um, infill the former Merritt uh, Canal to the south. The pump station uh, is situated on within a berm that at the dogleg of that Merritt Canal. So water is brought into the pump station through uh, the, the dogleg canal and is pumped and the, the flow is controlled by, dis, by conveying that pump station down gradient through a stilling well over a spreading canal or spreader feature and then into a recharge basin. So if we go kind of counterclockwise in these three photographs, we have uh, all of the features are shown here, the canal and pump station uh, for intake and the spreader basin for discharge. That spreader basin has um, a levee around it to contain the basin, but also armored gaps that allow overflow once the tailwater pool depth is reached. So the second upper right photo shows the directions of water flow conveyance. And that bottom photo shows what the recharge basin looks like in uh, as it operates. Got about next a minute. Slide. Oh, already? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Here are the canal plugs. 
uh, before and after we show uh, the canal plugs in, in construction, then in restoration to the left or to the right, I'm sorry. And also the wading bird populations that develop. Next slide, please. Now, just for groundwater surface water interactions to discuss our, uh, uh, how water gets into the upper aquifer, we have a Holocene peat underlain by fractured limestone and underneath that is marine sands and silts, ultimately underlain by karst of the Tamiami formation. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the excavation of not the Murat pump station, but the, uh, the larger Faki Union uh, pump station foundation. And we can see the hydrogeologic setting uh, is, consists of uh, undifferentiated quaternary marine sands and shells overlain by a Tamiami formation, which here is uh, rusty colored. And it's because uh, we're dewatering the pump station foundation and surface water with a lot of iron is coming through. What's important here is that you can see just rivulets coming out of that foundation and which causes issues with dewatering but it also indicates the transmissivity of this particular aquifer in this area. Next slide, please. Now, um, restoration uh, success takes a while to develop. And basically uh, we don't have a water budget with a, uh, a water budget for recharge versus evapotranspiration in this rainfall driven system. There are two monitoring wells down gradient from the uh, Merritt pump station. Uh, the hydrograph on the left or on the right from uh, one of the closest monitoring wells shows a typical wet season, dry season uh, sawtooth curve. And one of the indications that we are getting recharge is that the dry season uh, potentiometric surface of the Tamiami formation is increasing over time. You see those low values are show a higher and higher elevation. So it's a qualitative evaluation, but it seems like we are starting to recharge the aquifer. Next slide, please. And this slide shows the, uh, the same tendency. This is a little farther away from the pump station. We see uh, increased dry level or dry season water levels over time. Okay, final slide. Uh, the restoration status, nearly all of these features are in place. Uh, we just have to con finish construction of the flood control levees around the agricultural and private lands on the western side of the, of the, uh, the Picayune Strand. Two of three pump stations are now operational. Early data from the Merritt pump station and spreader system suggests that groundwater levels are increasing during the dry season and the uh, studies to evaluate restoration success are in progress. And that's my final slide showing before and after. Thank you. Thank you so much, June. What a wonderful restoration uh, story related to MAR. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Peter Mock, who is the principal scientist at Peter Mock Groundwater Consulting, Inc and a registered geolog geologist who conducts studies in hydrology, geology, and environmental science. He worked extensively on several remediation investigations related to Superfund sites across the West. And I'll turn it over to you, Peter. Good morning, can everyone hear me? Yes. Very good. So thank you for having me here to give you a presentation on the Gila River Indian Community's Magic for Recharge. So I start by saying I'm not a community member, but I've been a consultant to the community for about 20 years. So uh, if you could give me the next slide. The Gila River Indian Community is uh, in the middle of Arizona. You saw some of those uh, pictures before of the blue outlined uh, Active management areas in Arizona are how the Department of Water Resources and the state manages groundwater, at least uh, in the more urbanized areas. So on the lower left, you can see there's the Phoenix AMA and the Pinal AMA, and the Gila River Indian community sits right on their border with quite a bit of a jagged line going through it. 
which makes it interesting a regulatory process. Uh, on the right, we see briefly that uh, the cities of the Phoenix metropolitan area, Phoenix, Chandler, Gilbert, Queen Creek, et cetera, are right up against the Eagle River Indian community's boundaries on the north, and then on the south is the growing communities of Canal AMA, uh, Maricopa, Casa Grande, Coolidge. Uh, but more importantly for now, I'd like to see the ODUSF, that's the Oberg Dam Underground Storage Facility, which is uh, the largest and uh, first of the community's MAR projects. It's in the middle of the community, roughly, uh, and the Sacaton is where the governance center is for the Blue River community. And you can see it's right there in the middle. Next slide. So I'll give you a little bit bigger picture that here's the community, the black outline and the blue line going through the middle is the Gila River. And of course the reservation was uh, uh, drawn to incorporate the people who lived along the Gila River here in central Arizona. Gila River starts in the mountains in New Mexico, high altitude forests and then flows west through here where you see it. It joins the Salt River near the top of the picture. And then the fragments of the Santa Cruz River uh, as it goes across the flats uh, to the south of the Gila River shown. And again, I'm showing where the Oldberg Dam underground storage facility is. Next slide. So I'll give you a little bit of background and I'm not gonna do justice to this at all. There's an entire book uh, called Stealing the Gila by David DeYoung, who was going to speak to you, but was unavailable. Uh, he is the director of the Pima Maricopa In Irrigation Project. But briefly, the Gila River Indian community is a combination of the Akamo Odom and the Pipash peoples. Akamo Odom are better known as Pima, and the Pipash people are better known as Maricopas. But these are river peoples, and they irrigated tens of thousands of acres with Gila River divergence prior to the arrival of the Spanish. So they've been here a very long time, and they had a very thriving agricultural economy. Uh, since that time, the Gila River flows were diverted upstream they're completely cut off and groundwater levels were pumped down on both sides of the community. So uh, whereas the uh, river was in tight connection with the groundwater system before, uh, the water table is approximately 120 feet below land surface on the far uh, east side and it's about, it's, and it's at land surface or it's in the stream bed at the far east. So there's a wedge of available opportunity for storage. Next slide. So the goals of the MAR program at Gila River are to store water underground, but to also partially restore Gila River flows that can be seen at the surface, and also to partially restore riparian corridor along the Gila River uh, to, this is so important to the, to the river people, but they understand they cannot completely restore the Gila River flows or completely restore the riparian corridor. They're just looking for some sections of it to uh, help restore their culture. Next slide. So we conducted a recharge feasibility assessment in 2010. When I was at CH Stone Hill, I worked on the Tucson recharge feasibility assessment as a young hydrologist. And I brought that same uh, approach to this. Many departments and people, including elders, participated in that process. We took our time and really listened to everyone and talked through all the options. We identified the Gila Riverbed as a primary location for recharge. And I knew this was looking good because the US Geological Study Survey had looked at some floods during five months of 1983 and 1984 when a hurricane stalled out over the watershed and 250,000 acre feet recharged uh, beneath the community during that time. And using that same process uh, that the USGS did, um, I estimated that over a million acre feet went in in 1993 through 1998, uh, along with 83 floods, uh, that's up 1.5 million acre feet infiltrated naturally. Uh, again, we had some tremendous uh, atmospheric rivers that came in in 1993. And so that was a great test. I couldn't ask for a bigger test for recharge facility. Uh, so I identified just over a dozen locations where water could be delivered to this, uh, to the Gila River uh, channel bed. These are called MAR sites. Uh, we numbered them and we uh, talk about them in that vein like MAR 1B or MAR 5. And these MAR sites have been used and the recharge feasibility assessments been used since to select each succeeding project. Next slide, please. So a typical Grick marsh system is just to put the water into the natural low flow channels of the river, to the river, and these are called managed recharge projects in Arizona, as opposed to constructed. Uh, the, the community has an intergovernmental agreement by which this recharge is permitted under the state of Arizona system, and that system uh, considers as managed recharge where you don't do anything to the channel, uh, as opposed to putting in basins. 
Uh, water is currently from the Colorado River. Uh, this is called Central Arizona Project for CAP water. They showed you a picture of the CAP coming through Central Arizona previously. The delivered water infiltrates into the modern Gila River deposits, uh, which are the youngest of five Holocene fluvial units. We have extensive surficial geologic mapping through the area. Uh, and this one, these are 500 years or old or less. So this entire system is built by the Pima Maricopa Irrigation Project. It's operated by the Gila River Indian Irrigation and Drainage District. And it's monitored by the Gila River Indian Communities Department of Environmental Quality. Next slide. So just to give you a feel for the cross section, these are vertically exaggerated, but the Gila River uh, does its work by cutting and partially refilling. And uh, where we are doing our recharge is where you see T0 there. It's the youngest unit in the latest incision and refilling. And these are not big cliffs. These are only about uh, the, that inner uh, cut that you see is only about two or three, three, four feet high. Uh, but beneath it are the Pleistocene River uh, sediments of the Gila River. And beneath that is more typical sedimentary basin. Flow. Next slide, please. So here's the Oldberg Dam underground storage facility. It's about six miles long and it, uh, the river flows from the lower right to the upper left and the deliveries are to that point says delivery area. We have six monitoring wells to track water levels and to take water quality samples. Uh, there's a blow up here in the top corner expanded view of the delivery area where an agricultural canal is used uh, to uh, obtain the water. Two Rubicon slip meters are used. I'll talk about that in a little more detail to a delivery point. And you can see just to really quickly under the word delivery area that multiple channels are receiving the water, just the natural low flow channels of the Gila River. And then it extends for about three miles before sinking in all the way. Next slide, please. So two Rubicon slip meters, 50 CFS are used to both divert and measure quite precisely. It's an impressive piece of machinery. Uh, we have totalizers for each day for USF or underground storage facility reporting under the permits and as well as instantaneous readings that the staff takes every day just so operations knows about what the flows are. They explicitly keep the flow within the USF. This is a permit condition. Uh, so we define, arbitrarily define that lower boundary and just keep the flows all within them. And we temporarily stop operations when there are flood events on the Gila River, which have occurred a few times. We haven't had any large ones since we started the recharging. And uh, we started dividing the delivery to three directions as you saw before back in 2017. We found most infiltration happens close to the delivery point, as you'd expect with such a uh, system that can infiltrate water so well. And so we've recently added a second delivery downstream underneath the permit, and that's been operating uh, throughout uh, for much of 2021. Next slide, please. So it works. Long-term average infiltration rate is approximately one foot per day. Mounting is modest. It's 10 to 20 feet or so. The, the pre-recharge uh, Depth of water was uh, 90 to 100 feet, and in general, in the area, it's, uh, it's come up a few tens of feet. Uh, maintenance consists of just flushing with much higher flows. So if they run at 20 to 30 CFS, they'll blast it at 100 CFS for a day or two to uh, scour the channels naturally. And of, uh, what was interesting, although we comparing notes with other operators of similar systems found similar results, the total of the free surface water uh, surface evaporation and the riparian water use is approximately 2% of the delivered water long-term. Next slide, please. So here's the outlet structure. Uh, there's some riprap there to control erosion. And then you see uh, an area where it, um, the low flow channel uh, causes a bit of, of extended pine and then off it goes. Next, next slide. Two minute warning. You bet. Uh, here's the total volumes that have been recharged from 2015 to recently. And you see we've been running at about 20,000 acre feet per year. And you see the proportion of the water that's stored actually recharged versus transpiration and evaporation. Next slide. So monitoring happens both at the ground level uh, for riparian growth. You can see the riparian growth that's now come in in certain areas. And on the right is one of many raptors and wonderful bird uh, populations that have moved into the area. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we started with vegetation surveys by biologists before and after deliveries. We track it with GPS and stakes. It's just been amazing renewal. Next slide. Now we've gone to using drones. Uh, the, uh, drainage, the drainage district uh, staff who draw, fly the drones, and we have an automated procedure for using that, and we estimate riparian use with a fairly sophisticated process. Next step. 
And that's what the drone photos look like of the reestablishing uh, riparian areas. Next slide, please. Well, on the left, you see what it looks like when the first dribbles of water came across. And now you see what it looks like in some of these, these uh, near the wetted area. Next slide. And a really big part of this that's different from what you may have seen before is that this really has helped uh, cultural restoration for these peoples. Uh, they, I can't go into the details of what it means for them to have the reestablished river and riparian, natural riparian growth. And by the way, the riparian growth was not seeded. That, all those dry channels, when the water was added, that just sprung up. Next slide. The water quality, just briefly, um, let's just skip down to the bottom here. The total dissolved ions drop uh, from the native water about 13, 1400 down to about 800 milligrams per liter. And sulfate drops from 300 to 200. There's similar drops in the other major ions and some minor ions. Uh, but we have noticed that we had some problems with turbidity and total coliform. They really weren't serving as uh, indicators of the arrival of pollutants these are biofilms that build up in stagnant wells, and this is a downside of low flow sampling. Although it's an industry standard, it does cause some problems for the water just sitting there. With that, I'm done. Thank you. Peter, thank you. We'll move on to our next speaker, Andrew O'Reilly with the USDA Agricultural Research Service, where he is a research hydrologist, and uh, he also works at the uh, National Sedimentation Laboratory in Oxford, Mississippi. Andrew conducts research on groundwater sustainability and agroecosystems, focusing on beta zone and groundwater hydrology, green infrastructure, and much more. Andrew. All right, thank you for that introduction, John. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all uh, today. And I wanna to talk to you about a pilot project that involves uh, utilizing riverbank filtration Combine that with the groundwater transfer and injection to, uh, uh, with the objective of obtaining a sustainable agroecosystem and the project areas in the Mississippi Delta. I'd uh, like to uh, recognize my collaborators, Daniel Wren, Martin Locke with USDA, and June Brecky with the Corps of Engineers. Next slide. Also, like to acknowledge uh, a, a wide variety of partnerships. Uh, in particular, the USDA ARS and the Army Corps of Engineers Vicksburg District have uh, been working closely to uh, um, design, build, uh, perform the research and operate and maintain the system. And without the two agencies working together, it, it wouldn't be happening. Uh, also, there's a wide variety of other uh, stakeholders at the local, state and federal level that have been instrumental in, um, in getting the project going and keeping it going. Next slide, please. Well, first start off with sort of the obvious question, and I think well, we all kind of know uh, the answer here, but you know, why, why do we want to be concerned about sustainably managing an aquifer? Uh, and I, I kind of summarize it as sustainable groundwater as a prerequisite for sustainable development. Uh, as you may know, the United Nations has developed 17 sustainable development goals. And you can see this little graphic here uh, to the right that um, uh, 14 of those 17 goals have a, a, uh, a groundwater related target. So in order to meet that goal, there's targets that have to be met that are related to groundwater. Uh, so groundwater can't be underestimated. And of course, managed aquifer recharge, which is one technology that can support this. Next slide, please. Uh, take a, a one slide diversion to a little bit of, about history of the Mississippi Delta. Uh, if you've never been there, it's a very unique, uh, very unique region. Uh, it's generally considered to be the birthplace of the blues and other uh, American musical genres, uh, but also has a long history of racism, uh, slavery uh, toward African Americans and Native Americans. Uh, the, the murder of Emmett Till and his body was found in the Tallahatchie River, it was largely considered the, the uh, a, a seminal event in getting the civil rights movement uh, rolling. So there have been a lot of difficulties in the Delta. Uh, the Delta is a major agricultural region, uh, but many communities in the Delta still suffer from pervasive and long-term economic depression. So ultimately, uh, the objectives, the overarching objectives uh, of this project or a, a follow-up expansion of the project would be to increase water security uh, in order to 
in order to uh, provide a sustainable um, uh, agroecosystem and, st and sustainable uh, economy in the region. Uh, this uh, essentially, in a nutshell, the Mississippi Delta is a groundwater irrigated agroecosystem under stress. Uh, the, there's been a, a sevenfold increase in the number of irrigation wells uh, in Mississippi from the 1980s to today. And the little diagram of the state of Mississippi, you can see the vast majority of those are located uh, in the uh, northwestern portion of the state, which is the Delta. Uh, and um, uh, estimates of over 3 million acre feet of groundwater have been lost within the central part of the Delta uh, within a kind of depression uh, from the mid 80s to uh, late 2000s. And this has been a well a well known problem. Uh, it's been going on for decades. A number of studies have been done, and an aquifer injection storage has been identified as one more technology that might potentially reverse this trend of groundwater depletion. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide pretty much subs up the entire project uh, in a nutshell. Uh, you can look at it as four uh, components. Uh, first, we extract groundwater from an extraction well that's adjacent to the Tallahatchie River. So this is a river bank filtration scheme. So by pumping that well, we induce leakage of water from the river uh, and improvement of the water quality. Uh, in the process, we take that water, we pump it about two miles to the west and inject it uh, into two um, injection wells. Uh, and, and fourth, one of the key attractions of the scheme is that, of course, the water is stored in the aquifer and then it can be withdrawn as needed using the existing irrigation infrastructure in the region. So the, the farmers don't need to develop, um, uh, the vast majority of the farmland is irrigated with groundwater already, so they don't have to develop any new uh, irrigation infrastructure uh, with a scheme such as this. Next slide, please. Uh, the project objectives, uh, it's a pilot project. Uh, so we're assessing feasibility. Uh, we want to identify sustainable injection rates and appropriate operation and maintenance requirements. Uh, the photograph here to the right is the aerial view of the injection well site as soybeans and corn were planted at the time. This is a typical view of the Delta. You can see pretty much everywhere you see it is, uh, is cultivated. Um, and ultimately, uh, we want to determine uh, is this technology a viable path forward towards sustainability in the region? Next slide, please. A little uh, overview of the layout of the system. <clears throat> On the right-hand uh, image, uh, uh, the extraction site, as I mentioned earlier, there's one well adjacent to the Talancha River. You can see there's a, a bend in the Talancha River. Uh, and uh, the pipeline shown in blue, and then the two injection wells are located at the injection site. And the, and the large yellow boxed regions are uh, areas that have about six to eight mantra wells, the monitoring impact of the system. Uh, and look, with any injection well, back flush is, is, is part of the necessary uh, operation maintenance practices. So we discharge a backwash water to Lake Henry, which is just south of the injection wells. <clears throat> And uh, yep, you can go to the next slide. Uh, a little bit more about uh, the system characteristics is about nearly $2 million construction cost. Uh, we can adjust the flow rate on the extraction well as needed. Each injection well is per minute for a capacity of 750 gallon per minute. All the wells are 16 inch diameter. They're all essentially identical. The extraction well is a bit shallower uh, than the injection well, uh, but it's still on the range around 220 feet uh, deep. And each of the two submersible, I'm sorry, each of the two injection wells have a submersible pump uh, for backwashing at about 1,200 uh, gallons per minute. Uh, next slide, please. So we've conducted two operational tests uh, so far. The first was an initial three month test uh, from mid April to mid July of last year. We injected a total of about 550 acre feet of water. The average injection rate was about 730 gallons per minute per well. And it, it, it ended with the unhappy major clogging event uh, required a rehab operation. And, and I'll get a bit more into that in the following slide. Um, uh, we have started a second operational test that started in early February of this year. Uh, so far, we've injected about 365 acre feet. We've reduced the injection rate to around 570 GPM per well. Uh, 
And also we've increased the back flush frequency. And both of these are to minimize uh, uh, well clogging issues. Next slide, please. So some challenges, <clears throat> there's been many of them uh, for the project, but just hitting some of the highlights, the groundwater in the region has naturally high iron concentrations. So that results in fouling of, of water quality sensors, uh, fouling in the injection wells, I'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, also, um, we discharge our back flush water to Lake Henry uh, and the one milligram per liter is the typical iron limit for aquatic ecosystems. And we're not able to meet that, uh, um, certainly because the groundwater naturally actually already has uh, iron concentrations of uh, about 10 milligrams per liter uh, on average. Um, the clogging event uh, resulted in a, a sand bones and leakage of the injected water at land surface, something you definitely don't want to happen. Um, and we've also had a sinkhole develop at the extraction well. That's what's shown on the photographs uh, on the upper right-hand side. Um, and that's been filled with some washed river rock uh, for the time. Uh, related to that sinkhole, uh, I, I think it's related to it. We've had a drop in specific capacity at the extraction well. Uh, and uh, so that's been a bit of a challenge uh, as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so here was our unhappy clogging event. Um, uh, in mid in mid July, we got a phone call from a local farmer saying there's water flooding out around your wells. Uh, is this what's supposed to happen? Uh, so we shut them off. We went out there the next day, and as you see on the right hand uh, photograph, uh, there's a there were several holes around each injection well uh, where uh, there was essentially sand, boils, muddy water uh, coming out, injected water. Uh, in a nutshell, basically, we exceeded the buoyant weight of overburden, uh, which in hindsight seems pretty apparent, but uh, uh, at the time it wasn't clear. Um, the Corps of Engineers conducted an oxalic acid rehab treatment uh, of the wells. You can see here on the lower left hand as uh, a uh, video log that the core ran. So the left-hand one is quite a bit of bio, uh, biomass, uh, iron reducing bacteria adhered to the inside of the well screen. After the oxalic acid treatment, uh, we had a, a significant improvement, as you can see by the right-hand photograph. And the specific capacity was returned about 90% of the value it was uh, in May, uh, near the beginning of that first injection period. So we were really pleased that it, it all uh, was able to be rehabbed um, uh, successfully. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next, the last few slides I wanted to touch upon uh, more of the, the positive aspects uh, or some of the uh, project, so to speak, without, uh, rather than the, the problems. Uh, we have an extensive monitoring network. Uh, the uh, map to the right, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, We've got monitor wells around the extraction well site and monitor wells around the injection well site, 17 in total. All the wells are monitored continuously, at least hourly for groundwater level. Uh, six of those 17 wells are, are monitored twice uh, per month for field and water quality parameters, uh, temperature and conductance, pH and dissolved oxygen. Uh, while the system's operating, we sample uh, all the wells monthly. And those are analyzed by the Corps of Engineers uh, Erdic Lab in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And in addition to uh, sampling uh, monitor wells, we also uh, sample the Talanchi River uh, in the injection well back flush water, as well as Lake Henry itself in order to assess the any impact to the back flush water uh, on the lake. Right, next slide, please. Okay, so here's the data. Here's some of the data from our ground level monitoring. Uh, to sort of walk you through it, the upper graph uh, are monitor wells near the extraction well site. The lower are monitor wells near the injection well site. We started collecting data as early as January of 2020, so we have over a year of background data. And we see some clear trends. There's not been much continuous water level monitoring in the alluvial aquifer in the region. Uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, but you can clearly see rising water levels uh, during the uh, winter and early spring, these drops in water levels in the spring, summer, uh, those are drawdowns due to irrigation pumping. Then you have some recovery after that. 
Our first injection period shown by the first blue shaded region was uh, mid-April to mid-July of last year. Uh, at the extraction well site, of course, we had drawdowns, water levels uh, near the extraction well. Uh, at the injection well, though, we had a, a, a rise in the water level at the monitor wells uh, as much as about six to seven feet. And of course, the, 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 the rise was, was less uh, the further distance you were uh, from the injection wells. Uh, the section injection period is shown here uh, as well. We've had similar responses then. They're just of lesser magnitude because uh, uh, we have a lower injection rate uh, this time around. Thanks, Minute slide. Ones, Andy. Okay, thanks. So this will be a last a slide of results. Um, a little bit of comparison of groundwater quality uh, um, before and toward the end of the first injection period. The graph shown to the right, uh, these are the various analytes we're sampling for. Uh, what's shown, uh, and I'm showing the medium, max, and min values uh, for the, uh, uh, the groundwater observation wells. Uh, the black uh, uh, data is um, for March, which is prior to injection. And then the blue are the concentrations in June toward the end of that first injection period. So a few highlights I want to point out. Uh, the river water itself, uh, uh, of course, is oxic. Uh, the groundwater is suboxic. We have a, a DO of six or so milligrams per liter on average in the river. Uh, in the extraction well, about 0.3 milligrams per liter. And in some of the observation wells, it's, it's essentially zero uh, dissolved oxygen. We have high iron concentrations uh, shown by the red arrow. Uh, the median iron concentration is about 10 milligrams per liter as high as 30 milligrams per liter. Uh, and uh, all iron concentrations exceed one milligram per liter. So that's certainly caused some headaches, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have low arsenic or at least arsenic concentration shown by the dark blue arrow that are below the US EPA drinking water limit. And there's been no significant change in those. Uh, and also uh, we have some geochemical, uh, um, uh, we have some concentrations that I think are reflective of biogeochemical activity. Some changes in organic carbon concentrations in, in uh, nitrate and, and sulfate. Uh, and uh, next slide. And just in conclusion, kind of where we headed with this, we want to complete the second injection period. It's been running for about three months. We want to hopefully run it up for a total of six months. Uh, we want to determine the best O&M practices uh, so far at the lower injection rate and the back flush, we're now back flushing twice per week. Uh, that has been able to maintain a, a stable injection well um, operation. So there's been no indication of clogging whatsoever uh, in the injection wells the second time around. Uh, ultimately, this is a pilot project. So uh, we'll be making some estimates on uh, uh, projections of an expanded version of this technology. The USGS and others are going to be involved in some modeling work uh, with that. Um, and uh, next slide, please. And that's, yep, that's it. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, we'll now turn over to our final speaker for the. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. <laughs> it said unmute yourself, so I did. Um, and that was a mistake. Oh, let's see. Uh, well, Tim, you can help me pronounce your last name before we move along. It's Tomier. Tomier, thank you. Timothy Tomier, Tim. Uh, Tim is the interim city interim assistant city manager for the city of Tucson, overseeing the public works functions of the city. And he has served on multiple, multiple committees related to reuse, drought contingency, water management, and so on. And uh, since we're a little behind schedule, Tim, I'll just turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me out today. Uh, I'll tell a story about groundwater recharge in Tucson. And uh, actually the upper left part of the cover slide shows our iconic Sonoran Desert with the saguaros. And in the background, you can see some of our recharged basins in the Avra Valley, which is a big part of our water story. 
Uh, we are located in South Central Arizona, so we're the second brightest light in Arizona behind the Phoenix Valley. We have about 730,000 customers through a main potable system, nine rural systems, and a reclaimed water system. We do provide local and regional service in a 400 square mile area. And uh, we're in a semi-arid climate of the Sonoran Desert where rainfall is less than 12 inches per year. And when it does come, it almost always comes all at once in our monsoon season. So uh, we have adapted to our desert environment and managed aquifer recharge is a big part of that story. Uh, this is uh, a slide that shows sort of the hydrogeology of the Tucson area. Uh, this is a cross section running generally west to east across the slide. And uh, on the right hand part of the slide is where urban Tucson is in the Tucson Valley. It's a broad alluvial valley, but valley between um, some mountain ranges on three sides. Um, sand and gravel and clay deposits interfingered much like what you saw with uh, Orange County. Uh, but a very productive aquifer uh, over, uh, we have pro productivity down below 1,000 feet, and it could actually go much deeper than that. The Santa Cruz River flows through that valley from south to north, uh, but flow is a relative term because it does not flow very often in modern times, although it used to be a perennial river uh, pre-development. Uh, to the west of the Tucson Mountains is what we call the Avra Valley, which is an area where um, it was historically used for farming, uh, a lot of cotton growing out in that area. But in the 1960s to 70s, Tucson bought a lot of those farmlands, retired them for production to preserve the water for the future. And that's actually both been preserving of groundwater, but also the location where much of our groundwater uh, recharge and recovery efforts undergo. Um, so since the 2000s, we've been doing significant recharge and recovery, although it, it began in the 80s for Tucson on the recycled water side. Our water supplies are diverse. We have our groundwater, which is our largest supply, but it's also our supply of last resort because we've overused it. We've abused it in the past. Our goal is to preserve it and enhance it for the future. Our largest renewable supply is the Colorado River delivered through the Central Arizona Project. And that water comes into our customers' taps through our aquifer. We do recharge and recovery of that water. Um, so we recharge it through constructed spreading basins. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then we recover it through deep wells where it blends uh, the, the native groundwater and the Colorado River water that's been recharged. And that's the product that we deliver to our customers. If you want to read about the uh, attempt we made at direct delivery through a surface water treatment plant. Uh, there's a book out about that, about how not to do that well. The, uh, we also have uh, generally pristine aquifers, relatively uncontaminated, but we do have a, a large Superfund site uh, uh, associated with military operations in the area. So we do remediate some groundwater through an advanced oxidation plant. Um, we do have recycled water. You often hear whether Tucson was first or Scottsdale was first. We disagree, it was a tie. Um, we've been doing recycled water since the early 1980s. Uh, we do some direct uh, through a, a purple pipe system for non-potable use. And then we do use the aquifer for storage uh, for the future. And then we've begun to further exploit local rain and storm water. We don't get much of it, but what we do get uh, is, is a significant amount that if captured could um, both reduce the demand for our other water supplies, but also be used uh, as part of our climate resiliency strategies in the form of augmenting tree canopy in Tucson. So we have a lot of efforts into the rain and stormwater area. For Tucson, some of the biggest benefits for recharge and recovery, uh, beginning uh, our first recharge activities were with uh, recycled water or municipal effluent. We found that um, at the time, uh, the, the regional wastewater provider was providing kind of a secondary quality of treatment. This is in the you know, 70s, 80s. And uh, it had high suspended salad, high TOC. And uh, we found that through doing soil aquifer treatment through recharge basins, through using spreading basins and short recharge cycles, one to three days of recharge before we let it dry out and repeat the cycle. We found that soil aquifer treatment was effective at removing pathogens, suspended solids, and organics, and actually made it so that when we recovered that recycled water, it could go directly into the reclaimed water system. We find that both for the, we also find those benefits on the Colorado River side, 
the uh, aquifer treatment we do there, and you can see the, the picture sort of in the middle is some of our large basins in Avra Valley from a different angle. We see the TOC removal, we see uh, other uh, stabilization of the water as it fil infiltrates through um, the aquifer and the Vado zone. And we find that we can recover that water and actually deliver it directly into our system as recovered water. We don't have to do any further treatment of that water, no additional filtration. Um, all we do is disinfect and, and distribute. And that water quality, whether it's on the reclaimed water side or the potable side using our Colorado River water, it's very consistent coming from those wells. So unlike a surface water treatment plant that can have, uh, when you're treating a river water, you can have upsets in both how the plant performs or failures of the plant when you have like an algal bloom or something come through the, the system, recharge buffers us from all of that. So we find that consistent water quality to be a, a, a major benefit. We use it for both short and long-term storage. So we recharge it all and recover some of it on an annual basis to meet our annual needs. But then we have a net gain in water in the aquifer year over year uh, with both water supplies uh, by recharging uh, everything that we have a right to or the ability to acquire, and then only using what we need on an annual basis. So we're uh, net banking about a half a year's of water supply every year uh, in recent times. Uh, we do know that the Colorado River is undergoing um, multi-decadal drought, significant impacts from climate change, and entered its first shortage uh, in 2022. That has not yet affected Tucson because of our priority within the system, uh, but we do know that we're, we're banking water for a drier day. Uh, the use of MAC managed aquifer recharge also gives us resiliency against outages in our delivery canal versus a surface water treatment plant. Uh, if you're using a surface water treatment plant, you have to have water in the canal every day to extract, treat, and deliver in order to have water for your customers. When you have the aquifer between that source water and that production, you can go months, if not years, of interruption on the, on the delivery system and still meet the needs of your customers on a daily basis. And then we've also emerged into uh, recognizing that recharge facilities can be multi-benefit facilities. The lower right is a picture from our Sweetwater wetlands at our Sweetwater recharge facilities. Um, we, uh, when we first got into recharge, we were fence everything off, make it square, make it boring. It's all about water into the ground. Uh, we've evolved into a, a more modern perspective on that where embracing the multiple benefits of recharge is uh, where we are now and into the future. So this is a quick snapshot of all of our facilities. We have a lot of them. We've been at it for a long time. We use both recycled water and Colorado River water in our recharge facilities. In our case, everything is through either a constructed basin or the river itself. And as Peter Mock indicated earlier when he was telling the Arizona story, um, when you use a, a native river channel, you can, because uh, our native river channels are usually dry. Uh, but can uh, introduce water into those channels and through um, the permitting mechanisms get credit for the recharge that occurs. Um, so we've uh, actually been trailblazers on that and also um, expanded that to be multi-benefit facilities and moving that from more of the rural areas into the urban Tucson. So I'll highlight the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project in a moment, but that's where we brought this multi-benefit in-river recharge concept right into downtown Tucson and also led a, led a charge to change state law in order to get full credit for that recharge that we were creating. Um, some of our facilities are rather large, some of them quite small, um, but through recharge, all of our annual demands are met fully. And in fact, uh, we, as I mentioned, we store about half a year of new supply every year for the future. And currently, our current savings account in the aquifer, on top of all of the groundwater that exists, which is quite a bit, and renewable or re, uh, annual recharge of natural groundwater, uh, we have 550,000 acre feet of renewable water stored, which is about five and a half years of our supply. Another part of our story is we store for others. This isn't just for Tucson's uh, put and take and storage. We store significant volumes of water here in Tucson for the city of Phoenix for Southern Nevada Water Authority, for the Pasquayaki Tribe, Arizona Water Banking Authority, Town of Oro Valley, and many others, where we actually are a savings account for several folks uh, regionally uh, because of our approach to it, 
our plentiful aquifers and our success over time in managing aquifer recharge. So just a moment on the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project and how we've evolved. You saw that air photo was the rectangular basins in the middle of the desert with concertina wire around it. We now um, have evolved to making it a part of the community and embracing water, not just for what it means to us on paper or what it means to us for economic development or ability to meet customer demand, but what does it mean for the heart, soul, and culture of Tucson? Um, the Tucson began right in downtown at the base of what we call a mountain, and that area has been continuously cultivated for over 4,000 years with, with um, tribal communities, native communities, and um, then the Spanish uh, conquistadores and now um, Western European um, settlements. It's been continuously uh, a story about water, but we had dried up that river uh, since about the 1920s. The river no longer flowed. Only during large rain events did it flow. Well, we, using our reclaimed water system and our management of, of recharge, we introduced uh, an outfall to the river right uh, uh, upstream of downtown. And you, and you can see the, the ribbon picture is sort of a depiction of what our vision of what that area would look like in the future. And the lower left is, is a picture of how it looks after, how it looked. This was only after about uh, two to three months of charge. It's been continuous for now going on three years. June will be three years. We have the benefits of flowing water in downtown Tucson. We've been uh, restoring uh, native vegetation and riparian habitat in an important area for wildlife to move throughout the community. We've embraced and protected flood protection. We've seen economic stimulus from having this flowing stretch of the river. And of course, we've seen the impacts of groundwater recharge. So I'll conclude with my uh, Tucson's water story in one schematic. All with an asterisk of our water resources flow through the aquifer. Uh, this is a stock and flow diagram of our water supply. And you can see the in the light blue, the groundwater in the middle. That's our largest stock of, ground, of water supply. And you can see that most arrows flow into it. Uh, our Colorado River water coming through the Central Arizona project, uh, a bit is lost to evaporation either on its way to us or in the recharge basins or after the fact my light's about to go out. But the, but the majority of it, 98% or better of it, goes into the groundwater and joins that stock for use for potable water uh, and our customers. And that's where the vast majority of their water comes from. You can see that rainwater joins the groundwater through natural and mountain front recharge Although we do have some that we're harvesting directly uh, before it reaches the aquifer and using. And then we do have a small amount that flows out of the community. For the most part, Tucson's a closed basin where what, what happens in Tucson stays in Tucson. Uh, but during very large rain events, we will have a pulse of water that flows out, out toward the Gila River. And then on the right, you can see that after groundwater becomes potable water, regardless of how it became groundwater, we uh, introduce it, it becomes uh, potable water. We have a wastewater return flow to our groundwater or to our users um, at the uh, customer side. So while natural recharge can physically support a portion of Tucson supply, our legal access to natural recharge is very limited. Whereas man managed aquifer recharge is our primary water resources man management tool in Tucson. With that, I thank you for your time and I think we're ready to move into a question and answer session. So, thank you. Tim, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating story with, uh, and I truly appreciated uh, yet another example of geoheritage being woven into presentations as well. Um, we have, uh, now we're moving into our Q&A, which we will wrap up at uh, two o'clock. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, at this point, the floor is open for questions for any of our speakers. Nusha. You know I'm gonna ask question. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, everyone. This was fantastic. I have, a, I have three questions. Uh, one, one is for Charles. Um, I'm wondering what happens to the brine after, after what you do and how does that impact your outflows to the Chesapeake Bay? And if you covered that and I missed it, I apologize. Um, uh, 
And then I guess uh, the second question is for Tim. And I wonder how do you differentiate between natural and managed, uh, managed wa uh, aquifer water? And is that through your accounting system or do you have a different way uh, since you touched on the legal rights? And um, yeah, I actually go with those two. And then if there's time, I'll ask. Well. This is Charles, I'll, I'll go first. So with the advanced treatment approach we've taken, there is no brine return to the back to the wastewater plant or anywhere there, right? So the ozone biofiltration GAC approach produces some um, filter backwash waste that can go back to the wastewater plant. But since there's no reverse osmosis, there is no brine, which is a nice benefit. Is that why you chose that that approach? Uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons. Um, like I said, the big reason is that the 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 TDS in the aquifer is already quite high, and there is the presence of um, swelling clays, and and we have local experience with recharge wells with low TDS water that failed immediately. So, right now the the impression is that we can't recharge into that aquifer with real low TDS water um sustainably so we need that we need that salinity for the aquifer of course the treatment approach that i identified is also is also less ex is less expensive both on a capital and an operational basis it recovers you know nearly 100 percent of the of the water that's applied uh, because there is no brine return um but it's it's really important of course then to get comfortable with a non-membrane based advanced treatment approach and that's that's an active topic of a lot of a lot of interest around around the US and around the world right now. Thank you. Okay, we'll go over to Nelia Dunbar. Yeah, I have a question for Tim. Um, Tim, you mentioned that as part of your more modern approach to ASR in the Tucson area, that this, this helped you lead a charge to change state law. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that process. Thank you for the question. So in, in Arizona, um, we use the term managed aquifer recharge a little bit differently than we are in this room. Uh, when you're using a, a natural stream bed without modification, uh, we call that managed recharge. And the institutional framework uh, first created in the 1980s and carrying forward through some revisions only allowed you to gain 50% credit for that water you would recharge. So you can physically show you're recharging 98 or 95% of that water after you uh, account for evapotranspiration. Uh, but you would only get credit for 50% of the recharge. And the other 50% is what they call the cut to the aquifer. Um, and so that was a disincentive from using a river to do recharge when you could take that same supply and construct a, a basin outside of the river basin uh, off channel, and you could get 95 or 100% uh, credit. So um, we uh, actually uh, got that changed in 2019. Uh, it's one of those stories when you uh, we had a we finally achieved leverage. Uh, the drought contingency plan, which is a Colorado River thing, um, needed to be uh, passed. Needed to have a broad coalition of stakeholders. And um, long story short, in order to satisfy some of the concerns of agricultural users in Central Arizona, Tucson was willing to commit to doing some things over a short period. Uh, to shore up uh, water supply for central Arizona agriculture if we got uh, three or four um, changes to the code uh, that um, they made sense in 1980, but they didn't make sense in, in 2019. So we got the through that drought contingency plan legislation, we got um, the, the cut to the aquifer reduced for managed recharge, uh, what we call managed recharge, river riverbed recharge. Thank you. Great. Okay, we have a question from Rabia, and then we'll go to David Sedlak. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Rabia Chaudhry. I'm from the EPA, and I just want to caveat, non-regulatory part of EPA. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't get scared when I ask this question. So I have two questions, one for Charles um, and one for Tim. Um, Charles, really curious. Um, you know, Hampton Roads SWIFT project is really revolutionary in the way you've managed your um, specific challenges around um, 
you know, um, outfall to the Chesapeake and the very strict TMDL requirements uh, in that bay. I'm just wondering, have you had any conversations with other, your peers, you know, other wastewater treatment facilities up and down the Chesapeake and how they're managing uh, their discharges and whether they're thinking about approaches like yours and using M MAR, uh, because they're probably dealing with very similar challenges uh, that kind of drove you to do the, um, the, the approaches you've taken at SWIFT. Uh, so yeah, that- uh, Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we we um, we've had been a lot of conversation with Anne Arundel County in Maryland um, that's interested in a very similar um, approach right now. The, uh, it, the the it's it's actually a little different, but um, but similar technologies, similar aquifer system, not exactly the same. Um, so yeah, there are, I think there are some others interested on the East Coast, um, and um, yeah, I, I can answer absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. And mostly I was asking this because we heard about a number of different drivers today for MAR for water reuse. And this is really interesting regulatory driver that is pushing uh, water reuse and MAR in a direction that we hadn't expected. Um, and the other question I have is for Tim, uh, could you tell a little bit just for information, um, what uh, regulatory approaches are, you know, you've mentioned credits uh, in, in Arizona and we know there's of course, there's no water reuse regulations at the federal level. And um, as far as kind of in our understanding, there's nothing really at the, like in law necessarily at the um, Arizona state level. So could you help us understand a little bit about what uh, levers and permitting systems you're using uh, that kind of interface with your project? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, water is regulated in Arizona through two main agencies, the Arizona Department of Water Resources, which really focuses more on quantity and the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, which focuses on, on quality in the environment. And um, there are um, there is water code. There are things in Arizona's uh, uh, administrative code, uh, but much of it, and, and, and some things uh, that becomes very difficult to change because now you have to have a legislative act to change it, but much of it flows through the, the regulatory programs. So um, for, uh, any of our recharge projects, there's a number of permits we have. Um, if it's a recycled water side of the equation, we have to have what we call an aquifer protection permit, um, which is more focused on the water quality side of protecting the groundwater. And then we have a, a facility permit, which has uh, all the regulations about how you operate the facility. Then we have storage permits and recovery permits. Um, but all of that is kind of interwoven underneath the uh, 1980 Groundwater Management Act, which really was uh, the seminal point where, two, uh, where Arizona broadly moved from unsustainable to sustainable groundwater use. It, it's still on our pathway to coming out of that, but we had significant water level declines. Um, action needed to happen in order to um, uh, change that trajectory. So born out of the Groundwater Management Act, we have a shared water supply program where all new development in the urban areas has to show a hundred year assured water supply. Um, aquifer recharge is one mechanism by which we do that. Um, but so it's really a close relationship with the state and their regulatory authority that leads to what Tucson does and others do with, with aquifer recharge. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, if, if there's anything specific, let me know. No, that was great. Thank you. And to David. Yeah, so thank you everyone for some great presentations this morning. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person to, to, to engage with you. Um, I, I'm kind of, I have a more general question to everyone except for people uh, like, like, like Charles uh, who are on the coast and discharging the ocean. This groundwater centric view of managed aquifer recharge feels a little like a free lunch. That is, these flows that you're putting into the ground would have otherwise been base flow in a downstream section and recharged in another section of aquifer. They might have been environmental flows with the uh, hydrology needed to maintain uh, habitat for certain kinds of species, and uh, they, they might have been someone else's water. So I'm kind of curious if there are examples from the presentations this morning about when the use of managed aquifer recharge is restricted because those flows are not going directly to the ocean and are needed somewhere downstream for either uh, ecological purposes or for water supply. 
I'm, I'm happy to, to dive in a little bit. Good to see you, David. Um, so in, at least in Arizona, there's not, um, in, in at least historic time, not a connective uh, river system that uh, moves water from basin to basin. We do have subflow or you know flow underground flow from groundwater basin to groundwater basin. Uh, but where managed aquifer recharge comes in, it's it's almost always, if not always, a supply that um, you're either importing, though so it's only there because you've brought it there, Colorado River water supplies. So it's not, um, you could argue downstream in the Colorado River, uh, you're taking it out of that system and bringing it to Arizona, but that's all part of that allocation scheme. On the wastewater side, we do have um, uh, a complex ownership of that wastewater once it's been created. And um, typically the uh, whoever treats the wastewater owns the wastewater in Tucson, it's complicated by some IGAs we have because actually we retain, retain the ownership. Um, but in our case, um, we have some flow for environmental flows in certain segments of the river where it's been historically flowing as an outflow of a wastewater treatment plant. So we've uh, reestablished our riparian habitat. And that, that change to state law was vital to remove that disincentive from us from taking it out of the river. Because otherwise your incentive was take it out of the river because I, I can use it or store it. But if I lift, left it in the river, I lost it. Now we've changed that. So now you can preserve that. And the other is that effluent becomes an appropriable surface water if you lose control of it once it ends the river system. So we actually, in our managed recharge facilities, when there's downstream appropriators, we actually account for that in our um, crediting and our use of that stretch of the river. So very valid points in Arizona. Uh, we don't have a lot that actually flows all the way to a, a receiving water, but we've had to navigate those very issues to make sure that uh, people are made whole on their use, prior uses of that water. Um, David, um, uh, this is Bridget uh, Scanlon. I'd like to add a little bit to that. Um, I know um, uh, California, um, Helen Dalkey and some of her students evaluated how much uh, flood flows they could capture. And we did similar work in Texas and uh, greater than the 95th percentile and we could capture maybe how much water we use. <laughs> in the state um, and um, it didn't impact uh, other uh, water rights and the, then where there were detailed in-stream flows uh, studies done we would have to reduce the what we could capture by about 30 percent and allow pulses through and and meet different requirements for environmental flows but it still suggested that there was a lot of water but you can't take it, I mean, it was there for several days and, you know, have, storing it and then getting it into an aquifer takes time. So there are a lot of logistics that need to be managed to, to, to make it happen. And, um, but uh, we did look at some of those aspects and I think possibly Helen did also with her students when she did that analysis. Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can add, um, we looked into diverting flood flows above the 90th percentile and looking into the outflows um, into the San Joaquin, uh, Sacramento Delta. And at every point when we had high magnitude flows, the Delta was in so-called excess condition, meaning it met all the uh, you know, biological opinion criteria. Um, and um, the, yeah, the 90th percentile is a criteria that um, is often also used uh, to ensure that you know whatever surface water rights we have in downstream regions are met. Floodwaters are the only source we've left in California. So most normal surface water is already allocated. Yeah, I, I wonder if this issue is getting, it's getting, certainly getting attention in California, but in the South Platte River, for example, or the Mississippi River, it seems like it, it's not something historically people have been thinking about quite as much and would be nice for us to, uh, to, to, to discuss or at least have an opinion about. It. Yeah, I'll make a couple comments about the Mississippi. Um, uh, I think that's, of course, we're still just in the pilot phase, but any larger implementation of this, I think that's, you have to have some concern about impacting flows in the river. I mean, the current pilot project, 
at 1500 gallons per minute, that's about half a percent of the daily minimum flow, uh, daily minimum made flow in the river. Uh, but, you know, we might not need two injection wells, we might need 50 or 100 for a bigger scale implementation. Uh, the other thing that's sort of interesting is um, uh, the greatest drawdowns are in the central part of the Delta, Mississippi, uh, and the Talachi River is kind of on the east side of that, so it's not really located in the, the area of greatest drawdown, but rivers that do flow through the area of greatest drawdown have had major impacts on uh, um, low flows. So if, if the idea of transferring that water and injecting it in the areas of greatest depletion would would help mitigate that to some degree by rise, raising the water levels and it might actually improve uh, low flows in those rivers. All right. Great response, uh, Andy. While while we've got your attention, I noticed I was quite impressed by the number of monitor wells you have in your pilot. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, there's. Um, uh, well, first off, I'm, uh, I'm a relative newcomer to the project. Uh, um, I wasn't involved in the design uh, uh, and building of the system, but um, it certainly has been helpful um, uh, to have a large number of monitor wells. Of course, it has challenges of, of main, maintaining that data. Um, and, uh, um, but I'm not I'm thinking it was, number one, part of the reason for the large number is there really isn't a lot of ground monitoring done in the Delta of Mississippi. I mean, there has been for decades a twice a year uh, potential metric map done in the Delta. That's just been a fall and spring. As far as monitoring uh, continuous water levels, there's very, very few of those of that data. Um, in fact, we probably have most of it now uh, and just for this, for this project. So. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm scanning the screen for other hands up. Uh, did you, uh, Nush? Okay. Oh, Bill Alley is next and then Bridget. Speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to David Sidlock's question. Um, so the example I gave in Aurora, well, first of all, the map I showed for potable reuse, you probably noticed that all those, most of the sites were on the coast. <clears throat> so uh, particularly in the West. Um, the, the one in Aurora is interesting in the sense that Aurora, like many communities along the Front Range, actually gets some of its water from the Colorado River Basin and from the Arkansas River Basin. And so that's transported over to, to the South Platte River Basin. And so they actually can use that water to extinction because it's kind of, it's lost its uh, connection to those particular basins. But all the water in the South Platte is already over allocated. And so they have to let that water, they're not, re, they're not treating that water. They're treating not molecule or molecule, but they're tracking very carefully uh, the water that they get from inner basin transfer. And that's what they're using for for potable reuse. And Bridget, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I was just wondering if any of the people uh, developing these projects has looked at the energy implications of different management scenarios and if they quantify greenhouse gas emissions or other things or um, that was if anybody has tracked that or evaluated it or Yeah, I'll mention something Orange County done. So as I mentioned, imported water is a big part of our supply, 25%. But that requires a lot of energy to move that water to Southern California. So we've done calculations to show that our stormwater capture efforts locally present a huge savings in energy and greenhouse gas emission. So another driver, in addition to water supply resiliency, just another benefit of trying to maximize local capture of stormwater from an energy standpoint. Thanks, that's very interesting. Just before I ask my question, um, one, one comment on your uh, question. Um, Bridget, sorry, is that um, 
these are not wholesome answers just because even though maybe Orange County is not getting that water from Metropolitan that uses a lot of energy, that water does get transferred to Southern California and sold to others. So as a whole, we are not really gaining, but Orange County is obviously as a, as a service area is trying to reduce its uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, one, one question I have, which is a sort of like a follow-up to what David Sedlak asked um, uh, is, you know, the regulatory requirement for the utilities or wastewater utilities that are on the coast is, is very specific. So when you start reusing and recycling water, then you have less water that needs to be um, put back to the environment, but also the quality of that is lower. So I wonder how does that, those regulatory requirements impacting uh, you got, uh, some of you um, that are in the coastal uh, region. So basically trying to meet the EPA requirements on, um, on, the, um, on your outflows. Well, I can answer that question very definitely. You know, we've done a lot of work in this regard. So. To, to give some perspective, you know, we have right, right now seven, well, actually six treatment plants bubbled together with a mass load allocation for total nitrogen and phosphorus. And we can choose how we divvy that up, but that mass load allocation is headed steady down and has been for a long time. And, but it, we have flexibility, you know, to, to treat nitrogen and phosphorus, for example, uh, at plants where it's least expensive to treat it. And, and we take advantage of that. Soon we won't be able to take advantage of that basically because the limit will be so low. But what we, what we have done is that that allocation is, is will eventually in the future be based on our treated flow. So the, the flow that comes in the front door of the wastewater plant will be the basis of the allocation. Um, so we can take advantage of the, of the recharge that goes in the ground. So so one limit will be based on the flow that comes into the plant, um, and we can we can benefit then from managed aquifer recharge. But we still have concentration basin based limits to deal with. So annual average concentration based limits still exist, and uh, for nitrogen and phosphorus that is. And we still have, of course, BOD and TSS limits and ammonia limits and pH requirements and you know disinfection requirements and bacterial requirements. So we have all the same permit requirements. And yes, this is something that exactly we've talked about that, that if most of our discharge is during periods of wet weather when, um, when the, the wastewater treatment plant isn't performing as well, that's a risk and that's a concern that we have to manage really carefully. Um, and um, yeah, and we have a lot of, I, I mean, a large portion of capital upgrades for these plants is figuring out how to integrate well the wastewater plant and the advanced treatment facility to ensure we always have appropriate water quality uh, at the outfall, uh, in addition to the much harder actually is the water quality at the recharge wells. So it's a great question, and it's one that that practically I would say we've spent probably more time dealing with those questions than we have around the design of the Swift Advanced Treatment Facilities because we know what they need to be. We know what those facilities need to be. It's the integration between the two that's really challenging. Great question. Nelia, did you have another? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, a question. Uh, I have a question for those working with uh, ecosystem restoration uh, that have that aspect to their their projects. Uh, what is the greatest success and also the greatest challenge you have in terms of water compatibility issues, putting water back into the natural system? I can uh, I can start um, when uh, in our environment um, it's pretty a simple recipe. If you put water into the desert, things happen. And so um, when we did our Santa Cruz River Heritage Project, um, we there were some concerns about emerging contaminants or PFAS chemicals or things of that nature. Um, luckily or unluckily, some of our the groundwater, shallow groundwater under our major river courses has already been impacted by, by uh, things of that nature. And the recycled water that we're discharging is, is very low in, in those constituents and very high quality. 
Um, so it actually is a net benefit to the aquifer from both a quantity and a quality perspective. When it comes to the riparian habitat itself, we saw literally overnight impact from uh, opening up that outfall. Uh, there's a local researcher, uh, Michael Bogan, who's a, a biologist um, who immediately came out and started. The first thing he noticed was dragonflies. Re you know, So we're going from a dry river channel, literally sand and gravel. Um, he started noticing um, uh, dragonflies and, and dozens of species of dragonflies. I learned more about dragonflies in the first month than I ever thought it was to know. Um, but we, we within uh, several months, we were able to actually work with Fish and Wildlife under a safe harbor agreement to reintroduce uh, the endangered Gila top minnow fish to that stretch of the river for the first time in 70 years. So it, it literally was an overnight transformation of that area from a dry, barren, dry river channel to a thriving riparian environment. And now we have to take good care of it. We have to manage it, we have to keep the flows continuous. Uh, but water quality was not an impediment to uh, any of those activities, including the environment. Thanks, Tim. Great story. Uh, yes, David Wagner. Um, thanks. Uh, first off, I want to thank all of our speakers today. You've done a great job in kind of laying out the issues. My question is kind of broad ranging, and I don't know if there's any one of you who can uh, approach it, but I, I want to throw it out there anyway. We, in some of our areas, like Adam, you clearly have a long history in using uh, aquifer management, groundwater uh, management, et cetera. And also we've heard there are some new pilot studies that are just kind of gathering the data as it is. I guess my question is, where are the areas of research that are, are needed to help move this along even further? Is it water quality related? Would that help? Is it the cost part of this in terms of gathering and reinjection? Is there technologies that could be enhanced there? Or is it regulatory? And I'm just, I wanna get a sense of where where can we help this initiative move along in the process? Do you see holes or gaps where you find that we might be able to help out? Um, at the risk of jumping in first again, um, I would say that's a, that's a very profound question and uh, I think we should take advantage of it. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leap to direct potable reuse, um, which managed aquifer recharge is, um, and potable reuse has a spectrum from indirect or de facto to direct. I'm not gonna split hairs over how direct is direct, but in cases where recharge is a part of a potable reuse scheme, um, especially in inland areas, uh, an area for research is, um, in, in, a, in a coastal area, there seems to be um, a, a reliance, not always, so more on the West Coast, a reliance on reverse osmosis, brine, creating a brine that's part of your stream that sometimes can recapture, but there's still ultimately this, this waste product you have to deal with. Whereas in, in non-RO treatment scheme, schemes, uh, often you can avoid, uh, avoid that brine and that loss of water. Um, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a newer, approach to things and not as well studied as um, the full advanced treatment with reverse osmosis. So I would say from an inland perspective, the role of recharge in that overall approach to potable reuse and how from a regulatory and from a water quality perspective, um, what are the uh, acceptable treatment trains for potable reuse that we can have a high degree of confidence in and not say uh, Adam's train is better than Charles's train or anything of that nature, because every geography, every situation is a little bit different, different opportunities, different challenges, and research into how to do that all well and not have a value jump between different approaches, I think would be helpful. That's uh, my perspective. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I think uh, all of us are doing such different good work. I mean, this panel alone, I learned a lot about what people are doing all over the country that I wasn't aware of. Hopefully you learned something from Orange County. So I think uh, one of the values your organization can provide is just connecting people and getting people talking. 
because there's a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge out there, but um, if we don't know it exists, it's, it's not available to us. So I think really doing what you're doing here is very valuable, just connecting all these people and getting the research and practitioners connected with uh, what's going on, very helpful. This, this is Charles. You know, I, I guess I'll give one opinion that um, that in the in the scheme of indirect potable reuse, the topic of pathogens rarely comes up, it seems, anymore. Um, I, I know that's different in direct potable reuse, and the topic of pathogen removal is still bright and shiny. But in, in indirect potable reuse and managed aquifer recharge, really, the emphasis is all on emerging contaminants by stakeholders. And, um, and that then brings the question is, you know, of course, what's what's appropriate, what's not, um, and 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 then goes to TOC, which is really measuring, you know, bulk organics and not emerging contaminants. And you know, the 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 range of requirements for TOC is is tremendous out there um, in cases where uh, reverse osmosis is not being employed. Um, so so what's what for a given circumstances is appropriate or not appropriate in terms of bulk organics and what's appropriate and not appropriate in terms of emerging contaminants is, is really a hard one to, to deal with um, for you know, lots of utilities because of the uncertainty. And, and, and of course, you know, um, bioassays and get at some of the problem and non-targeted analysis you know, kind of makes things even more complicated, I think, um, at this point. Um, but this issue of, of, of where, where things are going to go, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, um, and, for, and for there to be some, um, some point of resolution on that, because you know, those are the questions that come up. That's really where the question and concerns are from stakeholders right now. I don't know how to phrase that more succinctly or get at what the problem is because I understand the nuance is tremendous and there's always um, um, things to talk about in this regard. Um, but it just, it, it seems like, you know, it's, it never, you know, there's always, there's always um, uncertainty and it's hard to get uh, projects to move when in the face of sort of unrelenting uncertainty. Great observation, over to Kathy. Yeah, thanks. Just that conversation was really interesting um, and made me want to ask each of you, um, what if any um, public opinion issues do you do you face and how do you manage those communications? Uh, you know, is that a struggle? No, no problem. I just what, be interested in your comments. I guess I'll jump in as far as the Mississippi project. I mean, we're still in the pilot phases, of course, but um, uh, and it's to serve the agricultural community. So it's really the producer end. Uh, there's, from, from the producer point of view, there's been a wide range of, uh, of um, support or skepticism, as the case may be, of the project. Uh, and um, I think that goes toward, a, a little bit toward the previous discussion. I think what Adam mentioned too, just communication of information. Uh, like I, I'm pretty sure this is the first and only managed aquifer recharge project in the state of Mississippi. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot to be learned from others. Uh, and I think that would go a lot toward, uh, um, you know, stakeholders, educating them and getting them plugged into the discussion. Uh, in Orange County, as you know, uh, a lot of projects like ours got shot down with the toilet to tap uh, headline that appeared mm -hmm. everywhere. So Orange County, we were extremely aggressive in our PR efforts to educate the community for the need for water. And, and uh, that's the reason that our project was able to succeed in our PR effort. If it wasn't for that, we probably would have been torpedoed like other projects in the region have been. We still have trouble getting going. So I can't stress enough how that education component with the public is critical. Well, everyone, at this point, uh, I have to give myself a 10 second warning that we need to wrap <laughs> at uh, 2 p.m. And uh, thank you again to all the speakers for excellent presentations and for fielding the questions. Thanks. 
as well as uh, to invite you um, same time tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern, same link to join us for continued uh, presentations and discussions regarding technical and institutional aspects of managed aquifer recharge. And with that, thank you very much for your attendance, your questions, your attention, and see you tomorrow.